with Sam Cedar. The destiny of America is always safer in the hands of the people than in the conference rooms of any elite. Sam Cedar. They are unanimous in their hate for me, and I welcome their hatred. We must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, by the military-industrial complex. The Majority Report with Sam Cedar. <laughs> And I get the feeling you've been cheated. It is Tuesday, May 19th, 2020. My name is Sam Cedar. This is the five-time award-winning Majority Report. We are broadcasting live steps from the industrially ravaged Gowanus Canal in the heartland of America downtown Brooklyn, USA. We're actually steps and steps. Well, you know the deal. On the program today, Greg Gonzalez, Assistant Professor of Epidemiology and Microbial microbial Diseases at Yale School of Public Health. What will the summer look like? Meanwhile, Trump's firing of the State Department IG halted an investigation into possible illegal Saudi arms sales. Florida reopens and closes their data. Meanwhile, China may lock down 100 million people again. Trump administration to short America 40,000 frontline coronavirus workers to save retirement and education benefits. Trump claims he's on hydroxy. No one believes him. Biden says he'll yank Keystone XL pipeline permit. Israel looking for U.S. approval of West Bank annexation for fear that Joe Biden might win in November. Official hearing has been requested to fight Barr's Flynn's charge quashing a Republican pact to dump $10 million in Montana as the GOP fears a Senate loss. And Republicans are now claiming they're going to hold an in-person convention. All this and more on today's program, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to the program. Glad you could join us. Um, got a lot to get through today. Um, I just a little bit of house cleaning. Um, well, I, at the end of the show yesterday, again, uh, we got involved in the conversation of people calling in to tell me that they can't vote for Joe Biden. And uh, I just, you know, it, it, that's all well and good. If you want to call in and say that you don't want to Joe, bo- vote for Joe Biden, don't tell me you don't want to vote for him because he's a bad person, okay? I, I, I may or may not agree with you. I don't care. If you want to call in and tell me that you have a strategy as to why voting or not voting for Joe Biden, voting for somebody else, and I'm talking about in a potential swing state. If you're in a blue state or a red state, there's no, there, there is no strategy involved in it. So you can vote, you know, you vote as you vote. And, and look, and I'll be clear, you can vote any way you want. You don't have to call in either. <laughs> I just want to be clear. I'm not your dad. Um, and, and frankly, my kids don't listen to me either. But call in with a strategy. If you can make an, a, a, a case that, People are going to be better off with uh, Donald Trump in office. Make the case. I get that there's some people who, from an emotional standpoint, can't bring themselves to do it. I have an opinion on that, but whatever. And I will say this. If you email me and tell me that you're going to quit the membership or stop listening to the show because of something I say, I'm going to 
make it clear to you now. I'm going to save you your email. Like, I don't care. I will, if I had the ability to prevent your IP from listening when people say that, that is the only way that I will, it's really the only thing that I really genuinely annoys me is not that you're actually leaving the, the show. That's fine. Uh, it's that you think that that makes a difference. Like that I do this, you know, uh, that, 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 that would make a difference. Um, and, you know, the idea, again, that there are no people who support Joe Biden or that would there are no people who would be upset. I just want to make it clear. Because some, somebody had emailed me and said that, like, uh, because it was um, uh, 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 who was it from Vegas that called in? Uh, yeah, Bro Flamingo from Las Vegas. Like, how could you, um, you know, make that argument with a black person? And I'm like, and I, and I, I, and I want to be clear, Bro Flamingo was not making, was not, it did not have an issue with me pushing back uh, because of its color. But I will say this, Biden won 58% of the black vote on Super Tuesday. He won 61% of the black vote in South Carolina. He won um, a two-thirds of the black vote in Michigan. He won even higher margins among African Americans in Arizona, Florida, and Illinois. And so I have no problem with Joe Biden. Uh, announcing that he's, you know, not going to seek the nomination anymore. I would be ecstatic, to be honest with you. Um, I would encourage people to where, when primaries are coming up to vote for Bernie Sanders. But the idea that the votes of the most consistently voting Democratic voting bloc are irrelevant because they're just listening to James Clyburn. And maybe they were. I don't know. I don't know what makes people vote for anything. But that they that their vote they they'd be perfectly willing to say like, oh, OK. Somebody else decides that um, that Joe Biden shouldn't be the nominee, then I'm OK with that, I think is just I think is wrong. And if you don't want to listen to the show because I say that, this is what you should do. Not listen to the show. And we, I mean, is that, is that obvious? Um, all right. I just needed to uh, get that off my chest um, because it's, I, I, I don't even want to get into these, uh, you know, these debates. I, I really don't. I just, I, I find them tiresome, but we had like three callers who called in. Uh, about that. And it was, I just, it, it gets annoying after a while. I mean, I, I, I think we have said it ad nauseum. I certainly don't need anybody to tell me uh, how bad Joe Biden is. I've been talking about how bad Joe Biden is uh, since before both my kids were alive. Now, uh, the one thing that helps me calm down though, um, after uh, a situation like that, Sunset Lake CBD. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, uh, they're sponsoring the program all this week. They are located in Alberg, Vermont, just outside of Burlington. Uh, they are the originally one of the dairy farms for Ben and Jerry's ice cream. They decided to diversify their farm, start growing hemp. They have, they have great business practices, pesticide free. They use organic fertilizer. Their minimum wage is $15 an hour. The employees own a majority of the company. They've got all sorts of CBD products. Um, for me, I am very much down with the tincture. I do. I have the uh, 750 um, milligrams. I take a dropper. I sleep like a baby. But they have smokables like this. Matt can talk about those in a moment. But if you don't like to smoke, uh, they have gummies too, which I'm going to hit up on their... Um, and they also have uh, salves um, 
for muscles and joints. And uh, it all smells amazing. They have a, 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 a coffee that is a dark roast infused with CBD from the 2019 harvest. Uh, you got to check this out. You can go to sunsetlakecbd.com. Matt, uh, just get, put a plug for the smokables uh, since you're the expert. Uh, yeah, I guess uh, I'm the expert. Uh, smokables are very good. I was skeptical of CBD, uh, but this is, I think, maybe because of the process they use. It's very uh, yeah, pesticide-free, farmer-owned. Um, very good stuff. Uh, I enjoy smoking it. It's nice uh, before bed, actually, if you have. So even if you smoke other things that might make you paranoid, this won't do that uh, nearly as much. It'll just make you a bit more sleepy. It just gives you the sort of the physical feelings more than the psychoactive feelings, correct? Exactly. Yeah. That's how you describe it? Yeah. I, I mean, I know what I'm talking about. But. <laughs> uh, it's sunsetlakecbd.com. Uh, if you use the coupon code left is best, one word, left is best. And those are three words, but you put them together. Left is best. You get 20% off anything on the site. So check it out. It is sunsetlakecbd.com. All right. Uh, speaking of uh, taking things that are apparently really common, Donald Trump uh, announces that he has decided that, you know, apparently he's taking um, what, what prophylactic hydroxychloroquine. Uh, I didn't know that it was prescribed as a prophylactic, but let's listen. And a lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. And you'd be surprised at how many people are taking it, especially the frontline workers before you catch it. The frontline workers, many, many are taking it. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine? I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. When? Right now, yeah. A couple of weeks ago, I started taking it. Because I think it's good. I've heard a lot of good stories. And if it's not good, I'll tell you right, I'm not going to get hurt by it. It's been around for 40 years for malaria, for lupus, for other things. I take it. Frontline workers take it. A lot of doctors take it. Excuse me. A lot of doctors take it. I take it. Now, I hope to not be able to take it soon because, you know, I hope they come up with some answer. But I think people should be allowed to. I got a letter from a doctor the other day from Westchester, New York, around the area. I, le- I read all my letters. There it is, ladies and gentlemen. He's announcing that he's taking this. Now, the weird thing about it is uh, that they released a letter from his physician. And I'm going to read it right now. As has been previously reported two weeks ago, one of President's support staff tested positive for COVID-19. Okay, that's uh, true. The president is in very good health. All right and has remained symptom-free. He receives regular COVID-19 testing, all negative to date. Okay, this is, um, the subject line on this incidentally was hydroxychloroquine. After numerous discussions, he and I regarding the evidence for and against the use of hydro, hydroxychloroquine, we concluded the potential benefit from treatment outweighed the relative risks. Okay, we could have that conversation too. In conclusion, with our interagency partners and subject matter experts around the country, I continue to monitor the myriad of studies investigating potential COVID-19 therapies, and I anticipate employing the same shared medical decision-making based on the evidence at hand in the future. In other words, uh, I'm not going to sign a document that says you're you're taking it. I think that's what that uh, letter from the president's uh, physician says. There you go. Uh, Meanwhile, folks couple of advertisements and then we will uh, we will get to our guest as you know sometimes very difficult to find time to read particularly if you have children or if you're a busy person i guess i mean i have no idea what that means if you don't have a ch- children what it means to be busy but uh there's an incredible app called blinkist i've talked to you about it before great way of learning new things getting ahead rounding out some of your um your knowledge base Blinkist takes the best key takeaways, the need to know information from thousands of nonfiction books. They condense them down into 15 minutes. You can listen to them. You can read them. You can uh, watch on your, uh, I'm sorry, you can listen on your uh, phone. You can listen on your iPad, your web browser. 
It's made for busy people who want the main points of a book quickly. They make it easy to finish a book during whatever, your commute. I don't know if people are commuting these days, but uh, you know, I don't know, before you go to bed, uh, before you have breakfast, as you're working out, whatever it is. Um, for me, it's been a lifesaver in terms of rounding out and basically books that I don't really want to invest the, the, the time in. Because I feel like, you know, uh, I, I've, I've told you about the four-hour work week. That was very helpful. And, you know, literally that whole book probably could have been written with bullet points. I mean, with all due respect to the author. Um, but, you know, stuff like uh, Everything Trump uh, Touches Dies by Rick Wilson. That's a nice 15-minute pick-me-up. I don't need to read the whole thing. Uh, but it's um, uh, it, it makes it super easy to uh, round out your knowledge base. With Blinkist, you get unlimited access. You can read or listen to a massive library of condensed nonfiction books, all for one low price. For a limited time, Blinkist has a special offer, just our audience. Go to Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. Try it for free for seven days and save 25% off your new subscription. That's Blinkist, B-L-I-N-K-I-S-T dot com slash Majority Report to start your seven-day free trial. And then you save 25% when you uh, continue on. Sign up now, Blinkist.com slash Majority Report. Uh, everybody in the office loves liquid IV. Um, in fact, it's probably one of the few things that the, uh, that the whole crew misses about the office is the liquid IV that's there. Look, uh, proper hydration, crucial for your immune system. It can boost your immunity. Liquid IV is an easy, healthy solution for dehydration. Liquid IV has more vitamin C than an orange, has as much potassium as a banana, has vitamins B3, B5, B6, B12, vitamins that are known to help your body defend against infections and made effective through cellular transport technology. One serving of Liquid IV provides the same hydration as drinking two to three bottles of water alone. It's healthier than sugary sports drinks. There are no artificial flavors in it. There are no preservatives and less sugar than an apple. Plus, Liquid IV is donating 2.3 million servings in response to COVID-19, with products being donated to hospitals, first responders, food banks, veterans, and active military. For me, I love the matcha because I like the energy boost as well. But I've been taking Liquid IV uh, when I was traveling. I would take it all the time. When I'm indulging too much these days, I'm basically uh, uh, having a packet every morning uh, because, or maybe before I go to bed, um, they also have one, I think that that provides better sleep, but it can boost your immunity. It can, uh, give you better energy. Check it out. You'll love it. Liquid IV is available nationwide at Target, Whole Foods and Costco, or you can get 25% off when you go to liquidiv.com and use the code majority rep at checkout. That's 25% off anything you order with promo code majority rep at liquidiv.com. Get better hydration today at liquidiv.com. Promo code majority rep. You can also find them nationwide, like I say, at Target, Whole Foods, or Costco. And lastly, uh, if you've got a uh, business, if you're starting a business at home, if you're, if you're uh, shipping stuff on a regular basis, Shippo is your new secret weapon. Shippo is the only shipping software for growing businesses that you can start today. You can set it up in minutes and then ship today. Shippo's volume discounts save you up to 90% off of carrier rates. Simply connect your online store to Shippo. No coding. You don't have to have technical expertise. None of that. You instantly see the lowest shipping rates from over 55 top global carriers like UPS, USPS, FedEx, DHL, all of them. Just click print and ship. Plus, automated return labels are free. You only pay if your customers use them. Companies that use Shippo, they save thousands of dollars. They free up all, tons of hours, and they grow on average 77% each year. We're going to get in that. Join over 100,000 companies like Goat, Hims, MeUndies who use Shippo. For our listeners, they're offering their best discount available anywhere. You get a shipping consultation and Shippo Pro Plan six-month trial for free at goshippo.com slash report. That's up to $700 value for free at goshippo.com slash report. Go right now, get your shipping consultation and Shippo Pro Plan six-month trial for free at goshippo, S-H-I-P-P-O.com slash report. We will put all the links 
to these in the podcast description and the YouTube description. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we're going to be talking to Greg Gonzalez. He is an assistant professor of epidemiology and microbial disease at Yale School of Public Health. Also an associate professor of law and research scholar at Yale Law. Uh, we're going to talk to him about um, what we can expect this summer and what we should be doing and what, what we could be doing. Be right back after this. We are back, Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It's a pleasure to welcome to the program Greg Gonzalez. He's an assistant professor in epidemiology at the Yale School of Public Health, as well as a uh, an associate uh, professor of law and research scholar at Yale Law School, uh, and the uh, co-director of the Global Health Justice Partnership. Uh, welcome to the program, Greg. Thanks for having me. Um, so. I mean, let's just start. Um, you had written on, uh, I think it was March 13th, which, you know, for me, maybe it was the 12th, um, was sort of uh, uh, because I, I'm from New York. My kids didn't go back to school after that day. I think it was a Thursday, maybe. Um, that's sort of when uh, at least the the reaction to the epidemic uh, or the pandemic, I should say, started in, in, in my world um, or dramatic uh, reaction, I guess. Um, but you were anticipating that we would have many of the problems that we were having that we are having now because you were you were seeing that we had had no preparedness. Give me a sense of of how um, from that point. Would you say that we are performing above, you know, if zero is the sort of like, uh, you know, the, the baseline, are we below uh, 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 performing in terms of our response before above or below that? Well, it depends if you're talking about the federal response or the state-based response. Um, so, or or the city or city-based response. At the federal level, um, we're slightly less than um, than sort of catastrophically awful. Um, remember, you know, we're about to, probably over the next few days we'll hit 100,000 cases uh, of deaths in the United States from from COVID. Um, just think about the number of people who died at 9/11. You're in a New Yorker, so am I. 3,000 people died in one day. Let's multiply that now um, from how many 9-11s uh, we've seen in just a few months uh, from COVID-19. So the federal response is a disaster and an abdication. Um, there are different states, you know, trying to, to do the best thing and trying to sort of logically and methodically sort of reopen their economies while ensuring that we don't have a, a fast resurgence of virus. Um, uh, there are cities like San Francisco that, um, had an early and, and sort of robust response that was able to uh, keep their numbers low. Um, there's, you know, there, New York City didn't do so well because um, it delayed, you know, there's a lot of been fighting New York City. So and in New York State, so New York City didn't fare as well as San Francisco. So, um, you know, as a country as a whole, um, you know, I'm a professor, you know, I, maybe I'll be nice and I won't fail, <laughs> fail us, but, you know, it's definitely D minus. Um. So, I mean, give us a sense, too, of what we know that we didn't know then about the virus. I mean, I, you know, like there, there's there's so much uh, information that comes out ranging from the strain that seems to be on the East Coast uh, that, that emanated out of New York 
uh, exist on the West Coast, only 43%. The rest of it is a, is a different genetic strain. Um, what, uh, yeah, the, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, no, so there's, there's really no diff- There's really, you know, viruses have lots of different sort of genetic, genetic uh, signatures, right? And the, the viruses that are, circ- we're talking about SARS-CoV-2, we're talking about one virus circulating in the United States. Um, you know, what we are knowing uh, more than we did when it started is about the sort of extent of its spread and its ability to get transmitted in, in different situations. We have a good sense of um, uh, what kinds of people have been at risk? Um, you know, n- nobody would have sort of guessed back in March that you know we'd see these uh, cute Kawasaki-like syndrome um, uh, diagnoses in children, who we were all told you know were going to be milder, have milder asymptomatic infections, um, and so you know we're learning a lot about this virus as as we go along. Um, I think uh, we're 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 seeing things that you know. We probably expected we're seeing hotspots in meatpacking plants and nursing homes and prisons, um, but that's sort of basic epidemiology 101. These are all places that are, people are packed together in pretty tight quarters. Um, so we're learning we're learning some new things. We're learning some sort of old um, tried and true facts about how infectious diseases spread in communities. Um, uh, and you know we're we're not even six months into this. So is the uh, are the new things? I mean, are, what uh, of the, the uh, of COVID nineteen is um, uh, unique or 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 surprising relative to what we would anticipate. I mean, obviously, the thing that makes it a pandemic is its um, is its ability to transmit to uh, to other people, right? It's the R not that they call it. Um, is there something about the the disease itself and what it does to the to the human body that is um, particularly unique in terms of what we've seen with diseases like in general? Well, you know, one is we have to, you know, firmly put this in. So this is a viral outbreak of a respiratory uh, disease. Um, And, you know, we've seen its cousin SARS appear in the early 2000s. You know, we've seen things like MERS, which are also related to it. What I think is unique about this is that the rapidity um, with which it's spread around the world. So um, I think, you know, the question about whether asymptomatic people can transmit probably um, uh, was in contention a few months ago, but I think people do understand now that people with mild or asymptomatic infections can transmit. I think um, no one was sure about what kind of sort of clinical phenomenon we'd see. Um, And, you know, there's been all the reports of people being on ventilators and, and, you know, for those with severe disease, but again, we have these... um, New sort of manifestations like the 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 outbreak of sort of this Kawasaki-like disease syndrome in kids. We're also seeing sort of um, neurological and other parts of your body sort of um, tangled up with this virus when when we think of it as just a respiratory infection uh, a few months ago. Um, we you mentioned uh, the ability for asymptomatic people to transmit. What? How does like? I mean, do we have a timeline for that? I mean, I, my, my understanding, you know, like when we, when we talk about quarantining, we do it uh, self quarantining, we do it for like 14 days. Correct. I mean, it, and, and presumably that's because I, I suspect that I was uh, infecting somebody or I had been infected f- within 14 days. What's supposed to happen within 14 days? And what is the timeline if I'm asymptomatic in terms of how contagious I am? Do we know that? I think we're, we're learning this as we, we go along, but if you think you've been exposed to somebody with, COVID-19, um, you know, uh, frankly, if I was, ex- if I knew I was exposed to somebody with COVID-19 in the same household or in a healthcare setting or in some sort of workplace setting, I would, I would um, self-isolate for 14 days to protect those around me from any potential uh, exposure uh, to the virus through me, even if I had a mild or, or asymptomatic uh, infection. Um, and so this is going to be, the problem as we go on, there's going to be, you know, as we open up the the country and people are going out to bars and restaurants uh, and thinking everything is normal. Um, this virus is silently sort of wending its way through our communities um, through the force of these asymptomatic infections or these people who seem to have a headache, have a little cough, um, but are still out in public. And so, yeah, I mean, if you think you've been exposed, you need to um, step aside and, and isolate for your, your own benefit and the benefit of your 
friends and family. So um, whether you're symptomatic or asymptomatic, if you feel like you've been exposed, you need to you need to do the best, do the right thing. So is the is the window of you being contagious only 14 days? I mean, if you're asymptomatic, let's say, is it the same as if you're sick? Because if you know if you get sick uh, over the course of that 14 days, then you know you have it and you stay, uh, I guess, isolated until you're feeling better. But if you're asymptomatic. Um, how long do, do we, do we know how long you're contagious for? Are you more or less contagious if you're asymptomatic or do we just don't, don't know at this point? Look, I don't, th- I don't think we know the, the, the sort of details. I think, you know, the reason we're saying, um, um, stay apart from, from your friends and family for 14 days is because within, t- you know, two to 14 days after exposure to a virus, you, you generally, uh, develop symptoms. Um, and that's been sort of the the um, the sort of rule of thumb. Um, is it based on you know ironclad facts and figures? I think we're talking about in general uh, a two week uh, period of isolation is the thing to do, right? Right. Okay. I mean, fair enough. I mean, I, I that's uh, you know these are just things that um, I know people have you know, uh, ask, uh, and I, you know, obviously I don't know. And, and it's, it's unclear to me, you know, some of these things you start to get into the, 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 the specifics of it and you start to just, uh, I mean, one of the things that I think we've lacked in the context of this, is these sort of these broad explanations from, uh, from, you know, uh, any type of, I guess, uh, official authorities or something. Um, so let's talk a little bit about, you know, what you anticipate. And, and we should say that, obviously, and, and we can talk a little bit about sort of the structural problems that we have as a society, which have, uh, which have made us particularly vulnerable to this. But um, when we're going forward in the summer, like what, what, are, what are you anticipating happening? I mean, because there, there's this sort of general feeling that people just sort of feel like, well, it's, it, you know, it's gone away or it's something's changed, but, but nothing has really changed in terms of our relationship to the virus. Has it? No, it hasn't. I mean, you know, look, we, you know, what is this week seven or eight of the lockdown, you know, everybody's tiring of this, right? Everybody is, is trying to think of um, a future without COVID-19 and trying to get back to normal. Um, you know, what we've seen as a set of public policies by wishful thinking, um, yeah, we need to restart the economy. People are suffering not just sort of from the disease itself, but the economic impact of, of businesses being shut down um, either temporarily or permanently. Um, the point is, is that, um, you know, the, the virus hasn't changed uh, what it's doing, you know, from four weeks ago to, to now. It's taking advantage of communal gatherings and, and people being in the same place together in purse, close, purse, close, purse, close personal contact, excuse me, um, to transmit itself. And so, you know, lots of the states that have been reopening um, have said it's an economic imperative that we have to do it. But many of them were seeing cases increase as they did this when even the White House's own guidance says you want two weeks of of decline in cases. Right. You want to have testing in place and contact tracing in place, the ability to isolate infected uh, people so that we can open responsibly. You know, and it's the whole idea that we can't do this is, is. is slightly ludicrous to me. You know, whether it's Germany or, or, or South Korea or Singapore or Hong Kong or New Zealand, lots of these countries are doing this. They've done it well, and when they've seen a resurgence, they've swung into action doing testing, contact tracing up the wazoo and isolating people who are, who are lingeringly infected. And so we keep saying, we keep thinking, oh, you know, as the president says, it's just going to disappear one day. It's overnight. It's going to go poof. It's going to disappear. The point is, is that it's not. And what um, I think you know, many people are thinking is now we're going to have this long, slow burn of, of people getting sick and people dying. And, um, you know, I have an 86 year old mother, you know, it's going to be elderly people um, and people who, you know, we're supposed to treasure our parents and our grandparents. Um, it's going to be, you know, kids who um, may be at less risk than an 85 year old, but could get a serious complication that sends them, you know, into the cardiac care unit. So, um, uh we're going to see a summer of sort of waves of infection in different places. We're going to see attempts to to, to sort of uh, contain these outbreaks, but there's really no infrastructure that's been established. I mean, we've had since, you know, February and March now to establish an infrastructure so we could have massive testing, massive contact tracing, isolation, you know, economic supports beyond, you know, a $1,200 check here and, and a little bit more unemployment there. Um, we just haven't done it. We sort of, you know, this is the ostrich version of, 
of public policy, sticking your head in the ground and thinking it's going to go away. And so the summer will be fun for lots of people and they'll think it's, you know, it's, it's all fun and games and they'll be at the beach or they'll be in bars and they'll be in restaurants. Um, many of them will go back to work. Uh, but some of those coworkers, some of those friends and, and family who they, they have a barbecue with or go over to their houses to, to, to have dinner with are going to get sick. And, um, you know, in a few weeks, a few days, we'll pass the 100,000 mark. Let's see how close we get to 200,000 by end of the summer. And I mean, but is there, and, and, and I, I have to say, I mean, it feels to me, and I think there's, you know, there's some, at least some reporting that um, the, the, the Trump administration is just basically uh, the less test means the less verified cases and the less verified cases uh, theoretically, and I think in their minds, like, um, you know, the less people will panic and the stock market won't fall. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think that's insane, but, um, you know, it's not necessarily not par for the course for them. But is there is there a way that we can avoid can, we can get to the other side of, you know, when when the when the virus basically dies out? Is there a way to avoid um, a, you know, is there a isn't there like a minimum amount of deaths that are probably going to have to happen? Uh, or, you know, assuming we don't have a, uh, a vaccine, a vaccine or have developed, um, you know, treatments that are better or are, are basically what we're trying to do right now is slow the infection rate, slow the amount of time that we get to like 60 percent or 70 percent so that we have time to figure out how to treat this better and save more lives and road to that. Uh, infection rate, I guess, or infection number? I think it's very hard for people to comprehend that um, as a nation, we made uh, a decision, whether it's by default or on purpose, you know, we can argue about it in the history books, but we made a decision that um, there was going to be no policy, right? And so, you know, the, the rational thing to do would to be to say, you know what, um, we understand the incredible economic peril that this response to this virus is uh, put on people's lives. Um, and we're going to do what countries like Denmark and others have done in terms of supporting their corporations, their small businesses, and importantly, the workers in their society by providing you know up to 80 to 90 percent of salary support. We could have said two, two months ago, you know, we're going to scale up testing, um, uh, uh, contact tracing and isolation to, to a degree that made us, you know, first in the world, we decided not to do it. And so instead, we're opening up economies. I think 49 out of 50 states are sort of opening in some way over the next uh, few days. Um, and we are going to see uh, more deaths than we need to need to see. You know, the question is, we made we made a we made an implicit decision that, you know, we're willing to sacrifice another 10, 20, 30, 40, 50,000 people um, because uh, we couldn't get it together to, 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 to do what other countries have done around the world. Um, I understand that, you know, this is going to be for the long haul, right? And we have to figure out how to live our lives in the context of COVID-19. But you don't start from sort of the worst possible position and, and, and say that's the defensible one. Um, so um, we're going to have to figure out how to, to move through this. But I think the, 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 the innovation and the, and the leadership is going to have to come from the states because it's not coming from the White House. Um, when you look at the states, are, are there states that stand out to you as being um, uh, particularly that that have done a good job since day one that have picked up uh, the, the the quality of their uh, um, uh, of their response? Yeah, you know, look, um, California has done a remarkable job. Um, you know, there was a uh, an article in the Times yesterday, the day before, about the tale of two epidemics, San Francisco versus New York City. Um, New York had a squabble between the mayor, the mayor and the governor, the health department and the head of health and hospitals corporation. And so you had two or two or, you know, two or more weeks of sort of delays in, in, in getting on the ball with the virus. And uh, and probably uh, that sort of political mess locally led to tens of thousands of additional infections. Um, you know, so, but, you know, in general, there, there are states, um, uh, Republican and Democratically led, um, Larry Hogan in Maryland, uh, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts, two Republicans, uh, lots of states uh, in the Northeast corridor, in New England and in the Mid-Atlantic, down on, out on the West Coast. 
who've really taken this seriously. Um, you know, that's opposed to states like Georgia and Florida who who have never taken this very seriously at all. And now there's a question in Florida if they've been massaging the data, um, you know, the same in Georgia. And so um, there, there are states that have really sort of taken uh, uh, the lead on trying to combat COVID-19. Um, and, you know, when we talk about states, we have to be careful because there are dedicated public health professionals, physicians, uh, and, and, and community advocates, you know, fighting for public health all over the country. Um, but it's... It, the decisions that get made, the buck stops really at the level of the governors. And, you know, we've had, you know, a, a large chunk of the governors uh, in the U.S. sort of abdicate, uh, sort of lock in lockstep with the president um, who, who refused to see the sort of urgency of what's happening around him. Are there broad principles that you think people should be, um, I mean, because we are, you know, in many respects um, uh, left to, our own individual devices in, 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 in many respects. And uh, more so, I think, you know, in some states than others, because, you know, I, I mean, I'm getting my constant updates from uh, NYC COVID and, and, and New York State COVID. Uh, I, I, I don't know if that exists in a place like Florida, where they, they really do seem to want to just if people don't, if we don't put it in the front page of the paper, uh, I think they think that it's just not there. Um, but what, what well, are, there, go ahead. So there, there are people at the University of Florida, University of Miami, who are, are wonderful public health um, professionals, whether they're physicians or, or epidemiologists, biostatisticians. So there's lots of local knowledge that people can rely on. Um, there's also sort of sound national sources for, for information. Stat News aggregates a lot of the health articles uh, that are coming out in the U.S. by the sort of premier health journalists in the country. You know, um, the health journalism um, that we're seeing in, in many of our, our national papers like the New York Times is, is is pretty damn good in terms of tracking what's going on. Um, so there's, there's guidance, I think. But what we have to realize is that summer is coming and we all want to be outdoors. Uh, that's a good thing. But being outdoors in a in a in a in a in a in a concert or on or or in a house party or a block party or on a beach where you're cheek by jowl with people is probably not um super useful you know we we need to to enforce sort of a uh uh idea of harm reduction in our own lives and figure out how we're going to keep our friends and family safe um and keeping if you can work from home keep working from home if you can't do that you know, make sure that your workplace has the necessary uh, safeguards in place to keep you as safe as possible. And if it's not a safe work environment, you know, you, 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 you need to figure out how you're going um, to organize to make it that way. But, you know, your employer shouldn't be putting your life at risk. You know, if you if you need to go into an establishment to a, to a bank or, or um, some other uh, commercial venue, you know, see what kind of sort of safety measures they have in place. Um, the idea is to minimize your harm over the next, we're not going to see a vaccine, you know, even though there's sort of, you know, why wild, wild triumphalism by the White House, we're not going to see a vaccine for, for quite a while. You know, I, I remember in 1986 or 84, Margaret uh, Heckler, who was Reagan's Secretary of Health and Human Services, will have a vaccine in two years. This well, is for 40 AIDS. years later. This is for AIDS. Um, in, in 84, you're so, saying. Yeah, in 80, yeah I, can't, I just can't remember. It's a long time ago. We were told we'd have a vaccine for HIV in two years. We're being told we'll have a vaccine for COVID in, in you know, in, in three months, four months, six months. So we're just going to have to sort of figure out how we can live with this virus um, and not go sort of um, over the deep end and sort of just think that this is summer 2019 because it's now the summer of COVID. So uh, in terms of broad principles, obviously, social distance, um, you want to be in place where there's airflow or 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 not, you don't want to be, I mean, cause we don't know. Right. I mean, like I was, you know, uh, contemplated, like, do, do I want to carry around a little personal mini fan that just keeps air flowing <laughs> across? I mean, but it also occurs to me that could be sucking in air. Right. And if there's somebody who's, who's asymptomatic, uh, and I mean, so what, what are the, the, the principles wear your, that, wear, wear your mask, wear your mask, wear your gloves. You know, if you're indoors in a restaurant, you know, you don't know what the airflow patterns are in there. You don't know where the air ducts are and how air is is um, moving downstream from you and upstream from you uh, over your table. You don't know who's sitting at the table next to you who could be asymptomatic. 
So, you know, I love going out to eat and it's going to be something I'm going to think about really um, long time before I think I can do it safely. Eating outdoors, takeaway, great. Um, being indoors in a restaurant right now doesn't seem like um, it's a thing I want to do to, to, to put my family at risk. Um, what other things like this, you don't, you're not going to eat indoors. I also, I can't imagine going to a restaurant, um, uh, to eat, um, take out, take out, take out, take out. And, uh, I wouldn't go to a movie. Uh, I wouldn't go to a concert. Um, but if I'm in like a, um, my understanding is if I'm in like in a big box store and I maintain some distance, I should be okay. As long as I'm wearing a mask, obviously, um, and gloves and gloves, how, how, um, how much of a danger is surface transmission, particularly with stuff like, uh, like the takeout? Like how, how worried should we be when we get takeout? So, you know, the point is, is that, you know, if you're, you're maybe we've been going to the grocery store and I wear a mask and I wear gloves and I wash my hands uh, when I get the groceries in the house and I wash them again after I unpack them and put them away and the bags go in the trash. Um, you know, the point is I'm trying to minimize harm. Um, and, you know, the reason I wear gloves in the store is because I figured there's, there's lots of touch points in the store where people have, have put their, their hands before me. You know, I also bring, you know, um, antibacterial wipes, which I've had in the house, you know, to the store and wipe down the cart. I mean, you know, it, it all seems um, like overkill, but, you know, we all now know too many people who've had, if, if they've not gotten sick themselves, they have a friend or a relative who has. And so, when you're in these situations where you know um, there's people like a grocery store or a big box store, you want to be able to make sure that they have you know sufficient room. And you know, I went by Home Depot yesterday, and there's a line to get in. They were metering the number of people who went to that store. You had to wear a mask. Um, you know, there was um, tape on the floor at the registers, so you were six feet away from the next person in front of you. You know, all these sort of precautions are going to be need to be in place. Um, you know, is it safe as, as just staying home and, and dealing with essentials? Uh, no, but a lot of people don't have that option. And so right. we have to make the world safer for those around us. Uh, what are your expectations in terms of where we go here if you had to uh, graph? I mean, obviously, on uh, March 12th, uh, you had a sense of, you know, uh, of where we were headed. When you look um, to the end of the summer and then when you look into, let's say, you know, by December, um, I, 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 do you anticipate the next three months being fundamentally different from the following three months? Are there particular, um, you know, uh, is there particular points on the timeline that you're particularly uh, concerned about? Is that uh, geographic? Uh, is that concerned, you know, a, a function of geography or, or, or what? So, you know, prediction is hard, especially about the future. Right. And, um, I think, you know, I'm not going to make any prognostications where we're going to be in December, but, you know, I think it's not unreasonable to think that we've set the conditions for endemicity, basically having COVID with us for a very long time. Um, we haven't done what other countries have done where, you know, there's no case, you know, they quickly swept in, um, got their initial cases under control. And when they've seen other ones come in, they've gotten them under control as well. Now, you know, it's in every nook and cranny in, across the United States. So I think we're going to see it for, for, for months and years ahead. Um, what worries me most is flu season. Flu season is, uh, uh, you know, not that far away from us. Um, and I remember in late fall of last year, the hospitals here in New Haven were already sort of struggling to cope with the sort of flu cases that were um, uh, uh, around us. And so think of COVID and flu happening together next winter. Um, you know, 50% of people get vaccinated for the flu and we have no vaccine for COVID. You know, we could see a, a double whammy happen in the winter. But, you know, if you look, you know, you're starting to see outbreaks in places of meatpacking plants and um, prisons around the country. You're seeing places um, that have already had to weak public health infrastructures, um, uh, you know, having to deal with, you know, you know, the cases in terms of 100,000 people per capita. You know they're in they're in they're in small towns and small counties in the in in the in the south and the rural Midwest, and so you know the ability for some of these these counties to handle what's coming at them or what they're experiencing now is going to be really difficult. And so you know it just I, I wish to God we, you know somebody would sort of answer the phone in the White House and we'd all say like we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna hit the reset button and and 
take this more seriously. But you know, now um, you know it's up to you to to sort of keep your your friends and family safe. It's up to you to speak out when you see workplace conditions or other conditions that are unsafe, and not in a shaming way, but to sort of say, look, you know, um, uh, these conditions are, are unsafe for you and your customers. Um, and I think we also have to sort of do what um, I learned during the AIDS epidemic is that. You know, you need to hold your local, state, and federal leaders to account um, because um, we are at their mercy in some ways. We can do them as much social distancing as we can, but you know, getting testing up and running, getting contact tracing up and running, getting isolation up and running, making sure we have the social and economic support we're going to all need for 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 months and years to to come to sort of manage this sort of um, not even once in a generation, once in a century, sort of catastrophe uh, means we're going to need to put pressure on those we have in power, whether we voted for them or not. Greg Gonzalez, uh, professor of epidemiology at Yale School of Public Health and professor of law and research at the uh, Yale Law School. Thank you so much for your time today. Really appreciate it. Anytime. Talk to you later. Bye. Bye. All right, folks. There you have it. Um, I think people, for the most part, know the, um, you know, the, the, the general principles that you got to follow. Um, close quarters, not good. Um, I think, you know, my understanding of, of, the, of the literature on this uh, suggests that most transmissions happen where people catch it outside and then bring it home to multiple family members. Um, not necessarily outside, I mean, outside the home. Um, there's not a lot of documented cases of people can, uh, uh, catching it outside, uh, per se, but I, you know, it's hard to know how much, I think that's a, also a function of like wearing a mask and, uh, and, and whatnot. So, um, stay safe. Nothing really has uh, dramatically, uh, changed and we have, really um, screwed the pooch in many respects and the pooch can't get unscrewed as it were. Um, but uh, we shall endeavor to persevere, I guess. I picked that up from uh, Josie Wales. Um, I think it was outlaw Josie Wales, that movie. Anyways, uh, folks, just a reminder, it's your support that makes this show possible. Uh, when you join the majority report, not only do you get the free half free of commercials, although we should, you know what, Matt, will you keep the CBD in for uh, members uh, today? Sure. Let them just hear uh, that because we want to get that uh, deal out to everybody because um, fans of the show and it's also um, very helpful. Believe me, I'm I hit that stuff hard. I think uh, maybe <laughs> earlier in the day, but uh, be that as it may, um, your support makes this show uh, possible. And, uh, when you uh, become a member, we give you extra content almost every single day, almost every single day, not always, but, uh, the vast majority of times, uh, you can become a member at join the Also, don't forget the AM quickie, am quickie.com. You can sign up there. Uh, and, um, don't forget, check out, uh, TMBS. They're live tonight. Matt, who's on TMBS this week? Give me one second. Uh, I need to pull that up. It's oh, Wozni Lambre. Oh, right. Uh, Woz. Is going to be on. And we have another guest here. I think they emailed me the outline. Yes, here it is. Uh, and we have. Oh, it's just. Just Wozni Lambre. Uh, and then there Daniel Bessner in the post game. <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> there it is. Um, you can check that out at uh, on uh, Michael Brooks's YouTube page. That's youtube.com slash the Michael Brooks show. You can go uh, to Patreon, patreon.com, TMBS. Uh, and know me. Good morning. Afternoon good, well, there. Morning good here. Good afternoon here. <laughs> um, also feels like afternoon here. How, how have you been? I've been well. It's hot in Arizona. That's the update. We've yeah. made it into the endless uh, summer. There's two seasons in Arizona. There's a uh, not summer, but almost summer and summer. So super hot and super, super hot. Yes, exactly. So no, things are the same, you know, cooking, 
fighting. You're cooking. Family. That's good. A lot and... of cooking. A lot. I've become the house cook. I've I've declared really? myself the master. Well, like you know. You got to speak softly now because you're I'm, about to I, criticize I, your whole family. It's not like I'm airing or anything. You know, I'm like a little bit of a foodie snob. I think it's happened. I think New York does that to you. Anybody yep. who who lives in New York knows what I'm talking about. And just I I'm used to those standards, so I'm I'm experimenting. I didn't know I I had these skills. It's, there you might go. be what I fall back on. Being the and uh, what's happening on uh, the show. Naomi Key show. So this week we have Reed Lindsay, who's an investigative reporter. Uh, he has actually been based, he's been based in Cuba for the last two years, doing extraordinary reporting. He's done a lot of investigative work all over uh, the world, Libya, Egypt, during uh, the Arab Spring. But he's been in Cuba and he's been covering how Cuba has responded uh, pretty effectively uh, to COVID and sent out doctors all around the world to aid other countries. And it's it's a really fascinating interview. Like I learned that uh, Cuban doctors, highly trained, that yep. are being sent all over. There's a monetary aspect of it. So Cuba actually earns money, and so do these doctors uh, when they work with other countries uh, that need their assistance. And it's not just through COVID; it's other, um, you know, other crises that might happen, like Venezuela, for instance. And then we have Shahid Buttar to uh, spend, you know, some time shitting on Nancy Pelosi. Fantastic. He's awesome. He's incredibly uh, so bright guy. So smart. That man needs to be in Congress. He needs. He, I mean, if this is if this is where we're going, the next generation, I feel that's what makes me feel better in moments right. of anxiety. People like right. Shahid Buttar and people like uh, uh, Nabila Islam, who just got endorsed by AOC's Courage to Change today. I saw that, too. That's a, excellent. Uh, we interviewed her on Ring of Fire. I can't remember exactly when it was. I think I, you, you were in the office that day or something like that. I can't it remember. Was? She's but, uh, she's uh, our matriarch candidate. We We love her. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's awesome. Well, we'll talk more about Nancy Pelosi in the uh, fun half because uh, she really, she really let Donald Trump have it, boy. Oh, oh boy, oh boy, oh boy, <laughs> does she just nail that guy? Um, I, I mean, I can't believe it. It's like, it, it's honestly, our political opposition leaders think that they're like on the the bus to camp. That's about that's right. Honestly, like <laughs> playing snaps. Uh, but we will get to that, Matt. Uh, yeah, first of all, uh, Nando Vila is going to be on PMBS too. So it's a full Woke Bros crew. Uh, also, and more importantly, p- uh, twitch.tv slash literary hangover. I played Red more Dead. More importantly. <laughs> I played Red Dead and uh, and listened to Richard Slotkin talk about the front, the mythology of the American frontier. So uh, check that out, folks. But yeah, tonight, Nando and Waz, it's going to be a Woke Bros TMBS. So there you have it. Make sure you also uh, check out the Antifada. You can find it at patreon.com slash the Antifada. Um, they've got, uh, I know they've got a new history as a weapon. And um, uh, Jamie is still talking about her interview from last week. Uh, a couple of things up there. She also moderated a panel. So go uh, check that out. It is uh, patreon.com slash the Antifada. All right, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, we'll take some phone calls. We'll do some sound. We'll do some IMs. Um, God knows what else. We'll be right back. No, do you don't want to share the news? Oh, oh well, I, I was going to announce that tomorrow. Uh, All right. I, I was going to announce that tomorrow. All right. uh, no, that's no fair. Well, we, we have merch <laughs> now. Oh. But I just, I, I wanted to, I want to set up a. Um, Leaving me a, a link. Oh, uh, it's, it's shop.majorityreportradio.com. I can share it now. Yeah, sure? let's oh let's check it out. Let's check out the merch here. Uh here we go. Look Ooh. at that. There's a the bandana. So timely. We got a bandana with the majority. Did you just logo. add that to the mix? We got a black t-shirt. We got the hoodie. Nice. That hoodie is um it's a little bit more expensive than I wanted it to be, the zip hoodie. But um, you know, it's is the it that's the uh you know, sourcing the stuff. Everything is union made, union printed. I think union right? printed and American made products, American made products, union printed. Uh, and we got the mask, wow. which says my mask protects you. Your mask protects me. And all the proceeds from the masks sales, uh, all the all the proceeds or all the the yeah the proceeds are going to Northwest Immigrant Rights Project, uh, which is an organization that 
doing great work uh, out in the Northwest. Uh, Did I say Northeast? Northwest Immigrant Rights Project. Um, so you get three of them for 30 bucks. Uh, we don't make anything on it. We didn't put a logo on it. We just want, you know, I, 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 that saying I like, cause it's basically a way of like well, going up to people and being like, don't be a jerk. Yeah. Just wear a mask for my sake. And then we got some sticker packs there and uh, there it is. Ladies and gentlemen, we've been promising this for 10 years. Merch 10 years. It is shop.majorityreportradio.com. Sastas. What does that mean? What's that SSS you were? That was just me trying to get your attention without uh, forcing through my voice on the air. On air. Sastas. I don't get it. All right. Uh, take a quick break. We'll be right back after this. Left is best. Jamie and I may have a disagreement. Yeah, you can't just say whatever you want about people just because you're rich. I have an absolute right to mock them on YouTube. He's up there buggy whipping like he's the boss. I am not your employer. You know, I'm tired of the negativity. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to upset you. You're nervous? You're a little bit uh, upset? You're riled up? Yeah, maybe you should rethink your defense of that, you fucking idiots. We're just going to get rid of you. All right. But dude. 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 Uh, you want to smoke this joint? Yes. Do you feel like you are a dinosaur? <laughs> Some good shit. Exactly. I'm happy now. It's a win-win. It's a win-win-win. Oh, uh, hell yeah. Now listen to me. Two, three, four, five times. Eight, four, seven, nine, oh, six, five, oh, one, four, five, seven, two, thirty-eight. 56, 27, one half, five eighths, 3.9 billion. Wow. He's the ultimate math nerd, don't you see? Why don't you get a real job instead of stealing vitriol and hatred, you left wing Limbaugh? Everybody's taking their dumb juice today. Come on, Sammy. Dance, dance, dance. Grandpa. I had my first post coital scene with uh, a woman. I'm hoping to add more moves to my repertoire. All I have is the dip and the swirl. Fine, we can double dip. Yes, this is a perfect moment. No. Wait, what? You make under a million dollars a year. You're scum. You're nothing. Excuse me? Fuck you, you fucking liberal elite. I think you belong in jail. Thank you for saying that, Sam. You're a horrible, despicable person. All right, going to take a quick break. I want to take a moment to talk to some of the libertarians out there. Take whatever vehicle you want. To drive to the library, what you're talking about is jibber jabber. Classic. I'm feeling more chill already. Good. Donald Trump can kiss all of our asses. Hey, Sam. Hey, Andy. Are you guys ready to uh, do some evil? Hitler was such an idiot. You think I might be a Nazi? Agree. No. Death to America. You. Yes. Wow. Wow, that's weird. No way! Unbelievable. This guy's got a really good hook. Throw our hands up. <laughs> uh, wow. Um, but Sam, I gotta get off. No worries. Let's, let's, I want to just flesh this out a little bit. I mean, look, it's a free speech issue if you don't like me. Hey, 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 shut up! Thank you for calling into the Majority Report. Sam will be with you shortly. Uh, the this hydroxy uh, chloroquine is really um, it's all the um, the rage right now um, because Donald Trump has um, is still pushing this stuff, and we know like they the VA stopped doing it. I mean, there may be some instances where it's it's effective. It's certainly hurting uh, lupus patients because they're having to ration it uh, now, is my understanding. But here is Donald Trump. Uh, explaining how he started taking hydroxychloroquine and um, and why why he's taking it. Oh, I I think for whatever it's worth, I take it. I was uh, I 
I would have told you that three, four days ago, but we never had a chance because you never asked me the question. The White House, did the White House doctor recommend that you take that? Is that why you're taking Yeah, White House doctor. I didn't recommend. No, I asked him, what do you think? He said, well, if you'd like it. I said, yeah, I'd like it. I'd like to take it. A lot of people are taking it. A lot of frontline workers are taking hydroxychloroquine. A lot of front. I don't take it because, hey, people said, oh, maybe he owns the company. No, I don't know the company. You know what? I want the people of this nation to feel good. I don't want them being sick. And there's a very good chance that this has an impact, especially early on. But you look at frontline workers, you look at doctors and nurses, a lot of them are taking it as a preventative. And they're taking, totally unrelated, but they take the z or the Zithromycin for possible infection. Now, I haven't taken that other than an original dose because the, all you need, you don't have to take it simultaneously. But the zinc you do take. So I'm taking the two, the zinc and the hydroxy. And all I can tell you is, so far, I seem to be okay. Can you explain, sir, though, why you started taking it? Have you been exposed? Yeah, because, no, no, not at all. I just said that I've had so many letters from people, like the one I told you about. I got it last week. I'll give you, would you like a copy of it? I'd love to give you. If you ask Bali, she'll give you a copy of it. But this is a doctor. He doesn't want anything. I don't know him. Never heard of him. But he treats people that are that we're talking about. And he said out of hundreds of people that he's treated, he hasn't lost one. And he just wanted me to know about it. That's all. It wasn't, he wasn't saying, gee, could I have dinner with you, Mr. President? I'd like to come to the White House. But I've received many such letters. I've received a lot of positive letters. Uh, I said, we're going to send him one. I am the prince of, uh, I am the prince from uh, Nigeria. And I just like the idea that like, I oh, just to get random uh, letters from doctors. And so I figured, why not try it? Uh, I mean, here, I mean, yeah. I mean, that's, that's, you know, I just, uh, whatever I get. I mean, does he try everything that, uh, I mean, is this something that we should be writing? Like I'm a physician, maybe, maybe, maybe a lot of bed rest might be good for you. That's a great idea. You're um, looking fat. <laughs> here is him being asked uh, about evidence of the drug's impact. And Trump's just like, evidence, shm evidence. I love it. I've taken it for about a week and a half now, and uh, I'm still here. I'm still here. <laughs> Can you explain, sir, though, you, what is the evidence that it has a preventative effect? Here we go. You ready? Here's my evidence. I get a lot of positive calls about it. The only negative I've heard was the study where they gave it, was it the VA with, you know, people that aren't big Trump fans gave it. And we've done the greatest job maybe of anything in the VA because I got VA choice and VA accountability, both approved. Accountability, Tillman, is where you can fire bad people that work in the VA, that you couldn't fire them. We had thousands of people that were sadists, that were stealing, that were robbers, that were horrible people. They would beat up our veterans. They couldn't do it in prime time, but they did it. When Pause they were sick. Second. Just remember, and we got count- what he's doing is he's answering the question as to the evidence of the drug's impact. I just want, like, when he started talking about the sadists that uh, working in the VA, you want to basically just to be like, oh, wait, what was the question again? It's about the impact of taking prophylactic doses of hydroxychloroquine, just to remind everybody. Ability. Nobody thought you could get it because of the unions and civil service. Mm-hmm. I got it passed so that now. You fire bad people in the VA. We got rid of tremendously bad people that should have never been there. But I also got probably even more importantly, if you can say that, maybe not, VA choice. So if you have to wait online for a doctor, you go outside, you have a private doctor, we pay the bill. We work out deals with doctors. We have pricing. So you go out, you pay the bill. And it was a great thing that we did. So we've done a great job with the VA, but they had a report come out. And uh, the results of the report, it was a very unscientific report, by the way. But I get a lot of mm. tremendously positive news on the hydroxy. And I say, hey, you know the expression I've used, John? What do you have to lose? Okay, okay what do you have to lose? Do so I, I have been taking it for about a week, a week for about a week and a half. Every day? At some point, every day. I take a pill every day. Uh, at some point, I'll stop. What I'd like to do is I'd like to have the cure and or the vaccine, and that'll happen, I think, very soon. There you go. Well, um, that study wasn't scientific, unlike me listening to stories people tell me. (laughs) 
exactly. Phone I calls are extremely scientific. Non-scientific. <laughs> I go by letters from doctors. I have no idea who they are. Don't know them. Don't know them. I want to but... see him take it on camera. That's what I want to see. Uh, I think a hundred is a scientific number. <laughs> so he's had a hundred uh, cases and no problem whatsoever. Do you think there are doctors out there treating a hundred cases of COVID-19? Like uh, unless they're in a, <clears throat> like a private doctor. <clears throat> that seems like a lot to me. Was it a hundred cases or just a hundred people? Like, it seemed like he... I mean, wait, why are we? I don't know why we're arguing this? over why are we this, talking? The, <laughs> Donald Trump talking about the letter he got from a random doctor. Where was saying, the doctor from? Take hydrocl- uh, I mean, the, I, the thing is, is that like, I could believe that he has a friend who is making a killing off this or that his sons or him or Kushner or somebody has a huge stake in a company that's producing this. And I could also believe He's just completely back rap crazy. And this is like the functional equivalent of like, you know, astrology just, but with medicine for him. Well, he has to be right. Like he said it on camera, he was embarrassed and now he needs to double, triple, quadruple down weeks later. I mean, this is something that he has done throughout his presidency, whether or not there's some sort of financial. Do you think reward. it's really taking it? I mean, I read that letter up, uh, up front from his uh, doctor that purportedly was released in response to this. And the letter specifically does not say he's taking it. They just discuss the differences of, you know, the, just the potential of whether it's helpful or not, not necessarily for him, but just in general. Right. And I can't tell if that letter is the doctor saying like, I certainly do. I, you know, I told him maybe it's okay. And if you're going to take it, don't tell me. And so I don't want to write that in the letter. I mean, it could be one of those things, like, because he doesn't want to be on the hook mm -hmm. for telling him. I, I Where's he getting it from? He would have to uh, get it from his I doctor, want right? it. Get it for me. <laughs> there you go. I don't think, I mean, if, I think they're going to give it to him. If he insists on it, they're going to give it to him. But Black market. He's just, you know, the Secret Service is driving him off into like some alley in the middle. Where does he get it from? Someone's well, got to be giving it to him. Somebody's got to be giving it to him. He, he had is. listeners call into the show who said someone, a, an official in Utah, had bought a huge stockpile of it and they were stuck with it afterwards. So I'm guessing someone he knows is like, hey, you got to start pushing this again, man. Mm -hmm. I, need, I need to move these numbers. Here is, of all people, now Neil Cavuto is sort of off, uh, you know, sort of off the Trump train a little bit. Maybe he's on like Always. the, um, uh, but here is Neil Cavuto who apparently is um, a little shocked at the whole thing. I, I mean, God, can you imagine? The president seems to be a little bit crazy. That is shocking. A VA study showed that among a population of uh, veterans in, in a hospital receiving this treatment, those with vulnerable conditions, respiratory conditions, heart ailments, they died. There are also a number of other studies out, including the Journal of the American Medical Association, which examined some 1,438 individuals in the New York area across 25 hospitals from the middle of March to the end of March. The study was a real chance to look at the, the, the benefits that the president insisted were hydroxychloroquine. They concluded that among residents, uh, residents hospitalized in metropolitan New York with COVID-19, the treatment or both compared with neither treatment, no statistical differences. A second study done by Justin Jalaris and colleagues at the New York Presbyterian Hospital, Columbia University Irving Medical Center in Northern Manhattan from March 7th to April 8th also showed there were no visible differences, that the risk of intubation or death was not significantly higher or lower among patients who received hydroxychloroquine versus those who did not. The VA study to which the president alluded wasn't a loaded political one. It was a test on patients there and those who took it in a vulnerable population, including those with respiratory or other conditions, they died. I want to stress again, they died. If you are in a risky population here and you are taking this as a preventative uh, treatment to, to ward off the virus, or in a worst case scenario, you are dealing with the virus and you are in this vulnerable population, 
It will kill you. I cannot stress enough. This what will kill you. So again, whatever benefits the president says this has, and it certainly has had for those suffering from malaria, dealing with lupus, this is a, a leap that, that should not be taken casually by those watching at home or assuming, well, the president of the United States says it's okay. Uh, even the FDA was very cautious about this, unless in a clinical trial, safely and deliberately watched. I only make this not to make a political point here, but a life and death point. Be very, very careful. I want to pursue this. It's not political at all. I mean, uh, you're basically reiterating that the president is giving out medical, uh, implying that the, he knows best in terms of medicine that uh, is potentially lethal. I mean, the my understanding about that VA study is that it was done after the fact. So it's not like a clinical study. It's really more a study of of what took place in there and you haven't set it up in you know in uh, in the in the way that you would if you really want to test the efficacy of the drug um but you would imagine that there would be more indication that it's helpful in some respects um just in in looking back you know retrospectively at the the data um but it's stunning that he's doing this and they just letting him go on and on about it it's pretty it's pretty nuts you know, Neil, I find so fascinating about this is there's this like weird um, division at Fox News. You know, they've always said it when Roger Ailes was around, like there's the news side and then there's the opinion side. And Neil, like he's not pro Trump and he never has been. But I wonder how much of this is like a protective, like to protect the brand of the company. Like you have to have one person on citing the truth and the evidence just in case something goes wrong when Sean Hannity is pushing hydrochloroquine, I can't even say it, um, on air every single night, like in case somebody sues them. Yeah, or, I mean, think of the younger people that work at Fox News. They probably like that there's somebody there that, you know, isn't a complete lunatic about this sort of stuff. Maybe I'm wrong, but... Also, this I, might I be... Think that, I, I, I think that's it. I mean, I think they, one, they want to, you know, uh, the... You know, even uh, Ailes allowed for uh, what's his face uh, to be on for all that time. Shepard, Shep Shepard Smith. Smith. But there's a difference. Between, I mean, Neil Cavuto is like a capitalist. He's on the board of News Corp. He's no, like, I know. Yeah. I, I, but I'm saying that 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 they they found value in having one or two voices of dissent from the party line there as a way of basically saying we let all voices on. Right. I mean, mm -hmm. at one point that was Alan Combs um, and, you know, he was doing it. Uh, you know, sincerely, I'm not necessarily adeptly, but he was d definitely sincere about it. But yeah, I, it, it I, I don't know. The whole thing is, is, is um, just, I think, you know, one more log on the insane inferno that uh, we have or the. Mm -hmm. um, and there's, you know, I think this is like not discussed enough, but so much of Trump's comms operation is Fox news. You've got the opinion side of Fox news, Sean Hannity's like best friend who ran the news company running the comms shop at the White House. Yeah, and Bill like, Shine is Bill it? Shine, yeah. yeah. And he, you know, I don't, I think it's been reported like that he and, and Cavuto, like there was always, you know. A little tension. Facts and like whatever political agenda we have. Uh, so I, it's kind of, I think that's just like, you know, behind the curtain a little bit to see the the, the pushback. And I think Trump was responding uh, to Cavuto. Uh, he tweeted out something to the fact that he had a problem with, uh, with Fox and, um, I mean, who knows? The Kabuto the, take might also be a one to your point, Sam, about uh, Republicans taking things personally once it affects them because Kabuto had major heart surgery not long right. ago. Uh, right. That would That's make true. some sense. All right, let's change topics for a moment. Um, we, 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 we covered pretty thoroughly, I think, the failure of the messaging bill. Uh, that uh, the Democrats passed on Friday. There was about uh, 11 um, Democratic Congress people who did not vote for it. Um, many of the squad uh, and a couple others. I think there was one or two Republicans also that. Uh, um, and we talked about it as a failure in terms of like the process, which allowed the message to get lost because there was no debate about it. Um, they only had a couple of days to discuss it. So very hard to message a bill that is already in the, the you know, has fallen down the memory hole. The other problem with it, it was um, 
it refused to let in some of the sort of like staple progressive uh, things that people wanted and uh, was anemic in terms of like healthcare coverage. I mean, the idea of, of funding COBRA is a huge waste of money and, and a missed opportunity uh, to say the least. The idea of like um, the uh, Jayapal's uh, uh, essentially paycheck protection plan um, uh, wasn't put in there because it was two or three hundred million dollars too expensive. In the context of, uh, excuse me, two or three hundred mil- billion uh, too expensive in a bill that is thirty times that size. Right. Um, same with student loan forgiveness. I mean, et cetera, et cetera. The, just the most unamb the most unambitious um, hodgepodge that has ever been in a $3 trillion package. So that's what Pelosi does. Um, And I say Pelosi because she really did box everybody out from that process significantly. You know, they said Jayapal's thing wasn't scored for the CBO as if anybody cares about this at that point. But the reason why it wasn't is because she was not allowing non-leadership members to get their bills scored. Mm -hmm. There was not enough time. And I don't know what the rush was because nobody's going to do anything with that bill. It's going to go down the memory hole, like I say. But here is Nancy Pelosi. And I've noticed, like, look, Joe Biden did this the other day, too. President Tweedy. Who cares? And here is Nancy Pelosi. Instead of being able to go in front of the American public and saying Republicans won't do this, Republicans won't do that. We offer a, a legitimate alternative to deal with the suffering that the American public is facing now and is going to be facing in a month and two months, and three months. Instead, instead, it is she scores her points by reminding us that Donald Trump is fat. Madam Speaker, what's your reaction to the president saying that he's now taking hydroxychloroquine? Um, Are you concerned? Well, first, let me say how happy I am about your new baby, how lovely, Wyatt. Wyatt, how perfectly named. Uh, we all know why that is, and how, congratulations. And as you, as you now are a father, you see how important it is to keep the world safe for the children, for the children. Uh, as far as the president is concerned, um, the, uh, our, he's our president, and I would rather he not be taking something that has not been approved uh, by the scientists especially in his age group and in his, shall we say, weight group, what is morbidly obese, they say. So I, I, uh, I, I think it was, it's not a good idea. Oh, my God. And, I mean, look, you say it in passing, you're doing other things, fine. But, the, you know, the, the, this has become the, the cause celeb. And it's really, um, you know, we see this. This is what, what Pelosi and Schumer have done. Schumer, like, you know, when they passed the first CARES Act, the big thing he was touting about it was that there was a provision that said that none of this money could go to the Trump family people. And of course, much of it ended up doing it anyways, uh, because it was backdoored. But regardless, like that's the that's we're faced with a pandemic and a depression. And you're touting the fact that none of the government relief uh, money is going to go to the Trump family. Like, seriously, like that's that's what you're offering people. I think they're just I I don't know if this is intentional or not, but part of me thinks that it actually might be that they don't even want to acknowledge how serious this situation is, because then they would be forced to deal with it. And as long as they are giving out lobbyist perks and and the mortgage uh, the 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 debt collectors perks while not protecting working people you know you you can't have both you can't sit there and say you're right we are dealing with an extraordinary situation and this act is protecting working people but that's just not true and we all know it and that would invite questions about well what are you doing for working people are you i mean why didn't you pass the paycheck Pro- protection uh act or the aspect of 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 Pramil Jayapal's plan why didn't you you know take into consideration mortgage relief and and rent relief why didn't you and just going through the list but if he, if she's not talking about it then they don't actually have to answer that question i feel like that's kind of where cable news is right now with democrats and that's how joe biden's campaign's being run without like, a doubt it's all just like we're just going to step aside and let uh, donald trump uh, implode but 
and we're going to put nothing that is even remotely controversial to anyone in any of these bills. And it is a, it is, I mean, look, the bottom line is either one or one of two things. I mean, the, the, the idea that saying we would, we would expand Medicaid, temporary emergency Medicaid expansion mm -hmm. would be politically toxic in this environment is absurd. It is absurd. It's only politically toxic in their narrow, narrow circles. There is just no way that Donald Trump is going to get out there and say they're offering free health care during a pandemic. Socialists. But do you think it's about the messaging or do you think it's about, I mean, I just think like looking at this bill, it's so transparent. Why do you even care about giving perks to lobbyists when it's not going anywhere? Why do you even care about giving giving money I, to all these industries I if it's going it's nowhere? I think it's signal to these companies that we're on your side. They're trying to signal to a bunch of different constituencies, we're on your side by doing nothing except for maybe sweetening the pot for a couple of different constituencies. And um, the, but the problem is, is that there's absolutely no message. There's no pressure being put on That's the uh, on the, the Republicans message. to provide. Well, That's yeah, the message. Yeah, there's no message to the general public. Well, I mean, Sam, you know, did you hear him talk about, did you hear him talk about Anderson Cooper's son and how it's for the children? I'm yeah. seeing now that they're increasing matching for CHIP by six percentage points. Ooh, so. ooh, ooh. Like for difference. the children, for six percentage points. Cooper's son. There you go. <laughs> I, I mean, it's just an abject failure. And um, I mean, I, I it, there is, there's a missed opportunity here, you know, and like, I, I do, I think this is going to impact the election. I don't know. I don't, I mean, my guess is it, 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 it will do exactly what it's designed to do to make the Democrats a non-factor in uh, the election come November, but it, it's also going to make them a non-factor legislatively going forward. And, and not just in terms of like, well, I'm talking about if, if Democrats win, but there's I mean, a history you, of this, like, you know, looking back, it's not like the when the Democrats win the House or or Senate, it's not because they've done some sort of like bold, progressive thing, at least in the last 30 years. It's because they've let the Republicans sink and then they just sort of are hands off. And then, you know, a lot of people run. Right. And, and, and the and, and the problem with that is that it sets you up to do nothing. And so you lose 18 months later because you have not been able to sort of like till any ground. You have no message, yeah. you have no mandate, you have no momentum, you can't get anything done legislatively. Simultaneously, you're also like in a, in a crisis like this, you're putting no pressure on the administration or the Republican party to do anything, to actually like do anything aside from winning. Uh, you're not in any way creating any pressure or any sense and I think like, you know, that that's what that bill feels like to me is a in, in some instances, a specific attempt to avoid getting locked into proposals that that's they right. don't want to deal with after the fact. That's it. Right. And I, I, think, mean, I so, mean, if I were running against one of these centrists right now, I would my tagline would be I stand for something. That's it. Yep. Like I look at Mark Kelly right now, who's killing McSally in the polls in the Senate in Arizona. I couldn't. I, what does he stand for? I like I I I listen to him. I'm like it's like gobbledygook coming out of his mouth, and it's like Trump and McSally, and then that's it. But he's he's up by like 16 points right now in the latest poll. That's outrageous in Arizona, and she's kind of moderate. I I am I uh, you know, in terms of 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 a, of a of a Senate race, if that works, great. I, uh, people are voting against Donald Trump, as far as I can tell. Uh, you know. Like Sally made her bed as, essentially as it was, you know, with her, you're from CNN, liberal claptrap, that type of stuff and, yeah. and, and voting for Trump. Um, but at one point, like you've got a lead and Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer are just not doing it. They're not doing it. There's no ambition there. There is none. And it hampers uh, attempts to legislate after the fact. Mm -hmm. Um it really Someone is. Someone should primary Chuck Schumer. Indeed. Here's Sean Hannity um, uh, bemoaning the fact that responsible residents in red states should not bail out blue states 
without seeming to know what the reality is or maybe just lying about how the flow of money works in this country. The two states that have the highest income taxes in the entire country, they're somehow drowning in debt. Well, for comparison, Florida and Texas, no income tax, and by the way, no debt, and they manage to balance their budget. Make no mistake, responsible residents who live in red states, in no way should you be forced to pay off the unfunded pensions, sanctuary state policies, massive entitlements, reckless, wasteful spending on new Green Deal nonsense, hundreds and hundreds of millions of dollars of waste. And we'll have a lot more on that with Texas Governor Abbott in a second. Um, you know, the fact of the matter is, is that he's, uh, aside from the fact that blue states send far more money to red states in terms of federal taxes, right? We pay much more taxes in um, uh, federal taxes in uh, New York and California, and much of that gets distributed to red states. Uh, Florida has $21 billion in debt. They sell bonds. Texas has $57 billion in debt. I don't know what he's talking about. Bill Shine That's dead. talking points. <laughs> there is a there is a deficit in their uh, budgets that they're trying to make up for. But that's because they're providing things like health care for their uh, for their constituents. Right. And this is like but this, they've been doing this forever. Every election year, they're always this is a consistent messaging point. And we as Democrats need to learn from Republicans, what they do, we, we sit here and we explain deficits and, and, de and people, their brains, like they, 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 they glaze over their eyes glaze over. Um, let's just touch on this too. Your, your, your buddy, Megan McCain. Oh yeah. <laughs> Megan McCain seems to have a huge blind spot about, uh, the 2008 race yeah. with John McCain. Let's see if you, let's do, let's do this. Where's Waldo. Let's see if you can find this here. She is, uh, bemoaning, uh, the fact that Barack Obama, who obviously been critical of in the past and simultaneous contemporaneously of, of, of many things that Barack Obama did. I mean, he's obviously just, um, at the very least extreme, much more pleasant to hear from. Uh, than uh, Donald Trump, but, uh, you know, and I think obviously better in a myriad of different ways. But here is Meghan McCain saying that Barack Obama ushered in the era of Donald Trump. And I just want people to just listen to this. And as you're listening to it, just think about what John McCain may have done to usher in the era of Donald Trump. And some people are saying that this wasn't the time <clears throat> or place to get political. What do you think, Megan? Oh, pause it for one second. I should just remind you, this is a um, Barack Obama gave a, a graduation speech, I guess, to all the graduates of 2020. And at one point he said, like, yeah, the guys in charge of our stuff aren't doing so great. But here's Megan McCain. Uh, I, he can get political anytime he wants. He's the former president. Um, I don't have much to say about this. Obviously, everyone on the left has basically appointed President Obama as nothing short of a saint. And obviously, I feel different, as most Republicans and conservatives do. I will say, I, the culture war that I believe is real and is raging in this country, I believe was ushered in with his administration and then exacerbated in the Trump administration. And if the election were held today, I do believe Trump would be reelected. And I think at a certain point, we have to start talking to each other in the middle. And we have to start talking about the faults on both sides because he was not a perfect president. And I don't think perfect presidents would have ushered in the era of Trump. <clears throat> Okay, and so, and my belief is that no, no president is perfect, no one is perfect, but you don't have to exacerbate one's imperfections. And the other thing is, you know. All right, we don't need to hear more of. Uh, I mean, the uh, I I love what she talks about the culture war, right? Ooh. I mean, the the culture war, first of all, was obviously ushered in uh, decades ago uh, uh, by the Republicans, largely, but. Um, no, but it's the black man's fault for exactly. making white people angry. Right. That that's the exists. cultural. That's the cultural war, war she's talking about. Mm -hmm. Ushered in. How dare he become elected and break open this culture war and usher in the era of Donald Trump? 
Who, what else? No, me, you're a follower of politics. What else might have led, ushered in, if you will, to, to usher is to sort of like, is to sort of just, uh, you know, uh, help the transition in. Mm -hmm. What else might have been a transition to the election of a completely unintelligent, bumbling, um, uh, foolish president who would lob insults and doesn't read, mm -hmm. but lobs insults and basically talks as if he uh, is a right-wing talk radio show host. What, what else in maybe John McCain's orbit might have ushered in that acceptance of something like that for the Republican Party? Are you talking about the campaign that John McCain ran? Well, there's something specific about the campaign. Is her name uh, Sarah? Palin? Oh, bingo. Yes. Sarah Palin is Donald Trump. But that's not her fault. Megan McCain didn't like Sarah Palin. See, if, if it was oh. up to Megan McCain, because she's an expert, she is a political expert. Like, let's not forget the way she talks. She's just so angry. It's like she was the chair of the Republican Party and that no one listened to her. And if it was up to her, we would be in a very different situation. Yes, of course. She, she's the one who knows all. Well, uh, nobody, yeah. Barack Obama wasn't listening to her either. So what she should be doing is criticizing her father for unleashing this, for dropping the standards of who could sit in the Oval Office. Exactly. And, and giving, but if there's no Sarah Palin and Sarah Palin doesn't go on to be a, uh, you know, a celebrity for four years or whatever it was and talk about the, the birth certificate. Mm -hmm. If there's no Sarah Palin, there is no Don, Donald Trump. And if there was a Republican party that had controlled, I mean, I'm saying this, who cares about the Republicans? If they had controlled their members, if they had had some sort of conscious, like they, if the Tea Party didn't exist, essentially, we would not be in this situation. And that did not, the Tea Party was not born under, under Barack Obama. If the Republican party was taking race seriously and bringing in Latinos and all the things that they talked about, like welcoming, you know, more moderate, diverse, younger members, then they would have had their eye also on this very, very angry base that was being, you know, really amped up by Fox News, their arm. It's not like Meghan McCain didn't use to work for Fox News. It's not like John McCain didn't appear on Fox News every day and have a deep relationship with them. I, I mean, to me, it's like uh, all of that is true, but th there is nothing that tops Sarah Palin. Of course. Who literally did the movie of Sarah Palin? Steve Bannon. Yep. I mean, he oh, directed right. Right, both right. of them. That's right. This She ushered in the era of Donald Trump and she was ushered into that position just literally plucked. Mm-hmm. Because John McCain's desperation to be in that White House. So uh, what she should be doing is get over the fact that she didn't get to be uh, to live in the White House mm -hmm. and maybe realize that her father is very much, if there's any one individual who is responsible for this era, and I don't think there is just one individual in terms of Donald Trump. There's a whole host of things that are responsible for it. But if you had to single in one person to usher in that era, it's the guy who chose Sarah Palin. Let's give Steve Schmidt some credit too. Steve Schmidt uh, as well. But at, at the end of the day, <laughs> it is John McCain's decision, right? I mean, that's who it is. Let's go to the phones. Calling from a 707 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? 707. Seven oh seven. Right. What's that? What? Seven oh seven. Yeah, that's me. Hi, it's uh, Kari from the Northern California. Hi, Kari. Uh, what's on your mind? So I wanted to call in and kind of talk about Cobra a little bit. I thought maybe I could explain it um, so that everybody's aware as to why it's so expensive and it's a ludicrous proposition. Sure. Yes. Please do. Okay. So Cobra came out of nineteen ninety six which I think was a reaction to the debacle of Hillary care. And it was a way for Democrats to say, we're still looking after the working class. And basically what it is, 
<clears throat> is it allows individuals to continue their benefits through their employer-sponsored coverage. <clears throat> so it's more expensive because benefits are supposed to be a part of your compensation. <clears throat> so it would obviously be more expensive than an individual plan. So I'm really nervous. I'm trying to calm down here. <laughs> no, uh, you're doing great. Um, so um, basically, COBRA is you're electing to continue the group coverage that you had from your former employer. And so you are required to pay the full monthly premium amount <clears throat> that your employer paid for your coverage. Mm -hmm. And on top of that is a 3% administrative fee. So <clears throat> for instance, just to take myself as an example, uh, I was uh, 42 years old and my group coverage cost the company about uh, $1,100 a month. It was a really good plan, supposedly. And uh, in order for me to continue that, I would have to pay that $1,100 a month plus the 3%. And in addition to that, if you elect COBRA, you are required to continue that COBRA for 18 months um, unless you get another job, which will cover you. So Nancy Pelosi saying that we'll cover this through January screws over everybody because mm -hmm. if they don't have a job yet, they're going to stop paying for that COBRA coverage, but right. they won't be able to go onto the exchanges. Right. Wow. Because they're still and get an individual plan. Jeez. I mean, it's just the the least possibly uh, efficient mechanism in which to get these people insured. It's just uh, it's just super super expensive. Um, yeah, it's it's ridiculous, and it is an absolute gift to the insurance companies. Totally, because of course, you know they would like to continue people in their platinum plans, which is what I had. You know, I was only paying fifty bucks a month <clears throat> myself as an employee. Um, for that coverage. So going from 50 bucks to 1100 is just impossible. What's the punishment right now? Is there still, have they? Have the they... punishment, well, there it used to be the, um, there's no longer a federal punishment, but in California, once, once the Supreme Court cut that down, uh, California actually has its own uh, requirement right. for coverage. So you could get uh, a penalty on your taxes. Uh, I appreciate the call. Dan. Yep. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Kari with a good call. Calling from a 703 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Uh, hi, this is Richard in Colorado. Hello, Richard in Colorado. What's on your mind? Hey, uh, first off, do I sound okay? Because I'm, I'm on a headset. You sound great. <laughs> okay, great. Um, so on the topic of the never Bideners um, at the beginning, I have a positive story to share from over the weekend. Okay. Um, so... I have a Facebook friend who's always sharing the kind of, you know, never Biden stuff that, that, you know, you or, or you hate to constantly hear about. Um, and I, I, you know, he sees, he shares this stuff all the time and I finally couldn't take it anymore. So I commented on his post, um, you know, I, I countered as saying, you know, right. Uh, Biden is better than Trump and, 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 uh, third party vote or abstaining doesn't accomplish anything. Um, and got in a debate with him and this other guy, so two of them. And I ultimately, the, they both agreed in the end that, or they both admitted that they would probably vote for Biden um, in the general election. And uh, someone on the show said that they doubt how. Um, the conviction of these never biden people and if they're actually going to abstain so this mm -hmm. is you know some anecdotal evidence of that and also i want to thank you guys because it was only from watching or listening to your show that i had the um the docking points oh, to uh cool. debate oh good so thank you all right well thanks um, uh thanks for the call good work uh, well, wait one, one quick thing yep um it's my wife's birthday today so can oh. i get a birthday shofar for jenny this is for Jenny. Sorry that it's happening during uh, this COVID, but. <laughs> Happy birthday, Jenny. Thanks, Richard. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That's interesting. Um, I think like there's a lot of pent up frustration and people are just trying to get it out. And then at yeah. the end of the day. It's... Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think so too. I mean, I, I just don't think the numbers are that, uh, huge as you know, uh, as it is. And, and I think, um, you know, 
Oh, I, I said all I wanted to say about the front. I don't want to talk about it anymore. <laughs> Are you sure, um, Sam? <laughs> at least for a while, anyway. I'm going to get Tom. an air siren for uh, next time we get a, a Biden warning. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, like what is the, that like sort of like uh, the the klaxon uh, the submarine yeah. klaxon? <laughs> uh, Colin from a five one three area code. You know, I don't. I wonder if uh, the the callers can hear the hello? hello. Who's this? This is Andrew from Ohio. Andrew, let me ask you a question before you ask yours. Uh, can you can you hear this? This this. Uh, tell me if you can hear this sound drop. This is beanbag. This is beanbag. You did oh, hear it. Yeah. Yes. Oh, that's pretty awesome. Okay. All right. Good to hear. You got to think of workers in your time zone, Sam. You have to sell out. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm but one out. thing I'm not kidding about is yeah. um, have you heard about um, Trump versus Vance? Trump versus Trump versus Vance in as in. As in, in in New York, what? Who's who's Vance? No, um, it's the case where Trump is trying to gain oh. immunity from. Oh, I get it now. Do you know what I'm talking? Yes. About? Is this this is their uh, um, what's the name? Uh, they're they're looking for um, uh, Cy Vance in New York is looking for uh, to investigate, is this to investigate the, the Deutsche Bank and get the uh, information from his, uh, his accountants? Mm-hmm. Yeah, with a, I can't remember the, the name of the account. It starts with an M. In fact, um, they had oral arguments at the Supreme Court about this a week ago, maybe, and I talked to Ian Milheiser about it, and we're going to play that interview tomorrow. Okay. I just think um, it wouldn't be so far out of field to think that Kavanaugh might be, you know, might want to return the favor on that nomination because I remember reading about him writing about presidential immunity before. I, there, I, I, I think the expectation is, is that uh, the Republicans are going to find like the Congress is really overstepping their bounds here. And, um, and I think there, I think, I, I think it, you know, uh, w w you'll, you'll hear what Ian uh, Milheiser says, you know, he's trying to read the tea leaves about, um, uh, how, uh, this is going to go down, but I'm not terribly encouraged by it. Yeah. And his attorney was actually making the fifth shooting someone on fifth Avenue. The president cannot be investigated. argument. Right. <laughs> Right. I mean, this is pretty serious stuff. Yeah, it's nuts. It's nuts. And remember, like they allowed um, the Paula Jones lawsuit against uh, Bill Clinton to take right. place while he was in office. Right. And there seems to me, you know, the the argument uh, that they're trying to make is that he's too busy. He can't he can't deal with this stuff until after he's president. But um, it seems to me that you you'd really uh, you should be able to investigate this um while he is president but uh we'll, we'll we'll let's listen to melheiser and then we will maybe know the results of of this case in the next month or two appreciate the call i do remember that though i mean do you remember during the kavanaugh hearings they were saying that that was his specific expertise like it, when he was uh that, that that it was presidential immunity was his like area of focus at one point or obsession do you remember that uh i i think so i mean um, I don't, I don't remember the specifics, but I have no doubt that he was, um, one of the things that was attractive to him was, uh, the idea that he would, uh, be protective of Trump. And I think they feel the same way about Gorsuch, to be honest with you. Um, Hey, uh, Dave Rubin has a new book out, as you know, and we're trying to do our best to, uh, to be supportive of that. Um, it has gotten just horrible reviews by um, non-hacks. Uh, a lot of people very disappointed that Dave Rubin, for a guy who talks about ideas so much, didn't present any ideas. He just wants ideas to exist, and he feels like we live in an era where ideas can't exist. And why? Well, uh, because of anti-racists. They won't allow ideas to exist. Ideas. Mm. 
I think there's a lot of people that in many ways don't want us to get through this. There's a lot mm -hmm. of people that thrive on keeping racial tension stoked and, and it's the anti-racists who, who actually are pushing the most racism into society, the, the supposed anti-racists who are the ones that are obsessed with our color of our skin and our sexuality and our gender and the rest of it. And then it's the other side that just doesn't care about that stuff. And then they use it as, oh, you don't care what color someone's skin is, you're the racist. And it's like, no, that's actually reverse. We gotta work through this thing. Can we get through it, I think is like, that's the billion dollar question. And I think the answer, if we can wake up enough people, and that's exactly why I wrote the book, if we can wake up enough people to exactly what individual rights are, to why the Constitution is so great, to why America, unlike any other country in the history of the world that not only brought all of these people here to, to blend in, but also keep their traditions and ethnicity and all of those things, but we also expand rights over time, right? We had slaves, we got rid of it, then black people could vote, women couldn't vote, now they can vote. Uh, gay people can get married. We've expanded and expanded and expanded rights. And, and I know that it will be my conservative friends who, in, if in the future, there's some other group of people who don't have equality, whatever, you know, equality under the law. It doesn't mean you have to morally like them or something like that. I know that it will be the liberty-minded people that will defend people's ability to be equal under the law while it's the lefties who will be sort Pause of using them as a I mean, cudgel to get- I mean, is this guy not aware of what happened with just- Gay marriage? Right. Is he not aware of oh who is pushing against the rights for gay people to get married? And I love this idea that like all these anti-racists are telling the other side, and let's be clear, right? There's only one race on that other side. There are a couple, uh, uh, you know, I'm not saying generally speaking, we know the Republican Party is, what, is it 90% white? More. Is it more? 95% white? Well, I guess you have to factor in Cubans. I mean, I mean, it is overwhelmingly white. Mm -hmm. Overwhelmingly white. And can you imagine in this country that white people are just, they're not obsessed with race? Well, you know, like if we, I just, I just want everybody to be normal like me. I love how he says we, like when there's a new thing that people have to deal with, a new quality that we have to take care of, we will take care of, we, we're Republicans. Okay, great track record there. Right, I mean, uh, this, I, 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 I think there's a decent chance that they're gonna end up trying to make uh, this election about transgender uh, uh, bathrooms, bathrooms again. Yep, yep. Um, I mean, consistently, almost definitionally, Practically, when we talk about expanding those rights, it is the right, the right wing in this country that stands in front of the, the expansion of those rights. Well, what I don't understand is at the top, he says he starts with something like we will get through this. And I'm thinking COVID <laughs> and it evolves into this. We will get into get through this cultural war that's existing. You know, the Karens arguing about keeping a business open. I mean, that's eventually, I think, what it's going to evolve into. They want. They're complaining about racism. Meanwhile, we're trying to keep the economy open, which helps everybody. I feel like that's kind of the, I don't think it's David Rubin in charge of <laughs> the messaging for them, but it seems I'm to sure be he, I'm sure he gets, um, he gets a couple of talking points. Mm -hmm. um, that is, there was an interesting story about um, uh, in uh, the Times about how the White House and the, the campaign, the Trump campaign, are having problems, A, keeping Donald Trump on message, uh, but B, they're having trouble coming up with a message. And, you know, we were, uh, I think we were talking about this last week where, you know, how does Obamagate help anything? Right. And part of the problem apparently they had, they tested 20 messages against Biden and they just cannot drive up his negatives with these focus groups, it appears. Wow. Um, that they, that they don't like, they... <sighs> They haven't been able to figure it out. Um, and, you know, that's part of uh, uh, Biden's strategy is that he's just, but, you know, his negatives are what they are. It's just that people don't like Trump. Right. They don't like Trump talking about him. There was a tremendous amount of sort of baked into the cake hatred of Hillary Clinton that was 
I imagine some part of it was sort of generic misogyny. And uh, another part of it was that there literally were people who whose entire careers spent longer than I've spent doing this, mm -hmm. talking into a microphone professionally. I've now done for 15, 16 years. But you had people who for 30 years made their money. Mm -hmm. Every single job they had was to attack Hillary Clinton and Bill Clinton. It was, I mean, that's how Fox News was built. That's how, that's how Rush Limbaugh was or, built. Exactly. Um, it was all Vince Foster. And, right. oh um, you know, he'd been doing it for three or four years. And it wasn't until uh, Bill Clinton got elected. And obviously the campaign and the run up. They hated Bill Clinton. Mm -hmm. Hated him. And uh, this is not a defense of uh, the Clintons or Bill Clinton's policies or them as people or any of that. I'm just making an observation that there was an entire cottage industry built towards demonizing Hillary Clinton. They, monopolies like, built. The cottage. Yeah. I mean, it, they turned into monopolies. And, and I, I mean, like, literally, like, it was like a doctoral program. And uh, so by the time she ran, there was such a high level of expertise. And then there was a, you know, they ran a horrible campaign. Mm -hmm. And on top of that, they were, and you know, I think, you know, look, the Comey investigation was a function of that cottage industry. And uh, Crooked Hillary was, a, was an example of that cottage industry. Steve Bannon had figured out sure. the whole um, thing on how to, how to do that. I mean, so, um, and they're just not that toehold with Joe Biden. Well, and, it doesn't help when Joe Biden's like, oh, if you don't like me, uh, don't vote for me. I, I mean, look, I, I don't I don't think this is a case of Joe Biden doing anything right. I think it's just a question of like, there's nobody. There's I mean, and it probably helps that he's a white guy yes. in terms of, you know, the toe holds that a guy like Donald Trump can find mm -hmm. in attacking him. Right. Like, um, I, think I suspect he, that with a woman and with uh, a person of color, um, black, Hispanic, Donald Trump would have found uh, toeholds maybe to trigger some of these, uh, you know, sort of these uh, Republican talking points, which is not to say that that person couldn't win, but um but I, but I do think that, like, at least in terms of them settling on a strategy, they would have settled on a strategy if it was, you know, Kamala Harris or if it yeah. was uh, Elizabeth Warren or if it was Cory Booker. Booker right. um, they would have settled on a strategy by now. And they can't seem to find a strategy with Joe Biden because. It's interesting because, like, I, I'm I mean, that's why Obamagate, it was clearly a form of of racial you know, reminding certain folks of the injustices that happened in the Obama administration. But I actually think the tar, you know, if you've noticed the right wing with exception, you know, to, to just covering the news um, and, and Megyn Kelly, who's got her own agenda of becoming relevant again, uh, they didn't really touch the Tara Reid story much and it, it died out. And I think partly because they're sexist. <laughs> like, I think there's a portion of, of the voters that they are trying to win over that just don't care, don't think it's a big deal. And in a weird way, deeply ingrained misogyny may actually think that Joe Biden's like a great guy for it. Yep. I, 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 I think if there's, I think they're like, he's not, you know, taking any guff from them. I think that, that, that uh, helps him. I think probably on some level, you know, there's uh, the, the Trump people are like, eh, this might be a little bit toxic for us to to do to do this directly. I, I suspect it's going to come up later. Uh, I, I suspect, but I, I don't I don't see why it will have any more traction then than it did this time. Um, you know, I mean, the Hunter uh, Biden thing is not really working because of the of the investor. I mean, they, I, I still think it's they come tested up. that yeah. without a doubt. Um you know, but the, the Hunter Biden thing takes him off of China and they want to try and tie it That's into right. China and they haven't been That's able right. to tie him into China in the same way that they they thought they were going to be able to. And I think the the thing is that they're going to try with Obama. They're going to try this Obama gate. They're going to make it like yeah. Joe Biden was a stooge for Obama. 
I think this, I think, I think one of the things that we can anticipate them coming out with is this uh, notion of like, here's a guy who was like, uh, you know, carrying water That's for right. a black guy. That's right. And they're going to make him look weak. They're, they're going to try and make him look weak. He's and tried like to a run cuff. for president all these times. Yep. He can't yep. get through. You know, the Democrats are putting him up because they can't find anybody else. Here's the problem with that, I think, for them on some level. That and I, you know, anecdotally, I, I, I've seen no data to support this, but anecdotally, it's an interesting theory that one of the reasons why African Americans took to Joe Biden so easily in terms of a, is that here's a guy who was in the Senate for 30 years, whatever it was, an old white guy who was willing to have hmm. a black boss and hmm. did so very loyally. And, um, and I, now I don't know, I, I, you know, it, it never occurred to me, um, that that would have any resonance. And I have no, um, you know, short of, uh, uh, one or two people saying this to me in person and having read it once on Twitter. Uh, I, I, it, 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 I, it certainly sounds like it could be a, you know, the, something that people respect about, uh, Joe Biden, that he, um, you know, I mean, I, don't I know, know how you that, measure that though. I mean, that's, I don't know how you measure yeah, that. I don't know that you can, possible. but I do know that like, you know, there's the sentiment of like, you know, um, uh, there was an era, I think this era is probably still around in some sectors, less so in others where it was like, um, men had trouble having a, a female boss oh, absolutely. and the, uh, ability of a man to have a female boss um, was considered a positive attribute by other women. And, and, you know, uh, fairly obvious reasons why one would have that reaction. Um, so I don't know, but I don't think it's going to be effective. It's just, it's, it, I just find it uh, fascinating that they are keep searching around mm -hmm. uh, for this stuff. Um, here's Bill Barr, who is basically saying that he doesn't think um, that Durham, he doesn't think, and I'm really, I, I'm, I wonder what he's doing here. He doesn't expect that the ongoing review of the uh, Trump Russia probe is going to lead to a criminal investigation of Obama or Biden. I don't know if that's his way of trying to introduce this idea or what, but, um, Bill Barr doesn't go out there and say this stuff without having a calculated reason for it. Let's play this clip. This is number nine. Now I have a general idea of how Mr. Durham's investigation is going. And as I have indicated, some aspects of the matter are being examined as potential crimes. But we have to bear in mind what the Supreme Court recently reminded us of in the Bridgegate case. As the court said there, there's a difference between an abuse of power and a federal crime. Not every abuse of power, no matter how outrageous, is necessarily a federal crime. Now, as to President Obama and Vice President Biden, whatever their level of involvement, based on the information I have today, I don't expect Mr. Durham's work will lead to a criminal investigation of either man. Our concern over potential criminality is focused on others. So, I mean, to me, that basically sounds like he's saying, like, look, they, they, they abuse their power. That's what they're going to try and push. That they, he is setting the predicate for um, there's a high bar to bring criminal charges against people in that authority. And you can abuse power and still not have done something criminal. So it, mm -hmm. it, it, it means that they get their cake and eat it, too. They can right. just bluff their way through this entire That's thing. Right. That's right. And it's just one more attack against, if you heard uh, Trump yesterday, looping it back to Obama. You know, when asked a question, he just immediately was like, well, this was an Obama decision. This was an Obama decision. It's, it's. I just don't think that's going to be terribly effective. I don't know. Maybe. Well, who knows? I, I, They're maybe. so much better. They're so much better at um, holding, even if it's for stuff that they didn't do, uh, Democratic previous administrations or a previous administration to mm -hmm. account than uh, than than Democrats are. It's 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 nuts. 
Jonathan Armstead on the IM. Sam, I have a comment about fixing the choice of a presidential election when one candidate is a bad dude. Say you had one candidate who worked with the Cylon Android agents and botched the scientific test to detect sleeper agents in the fleet. Even if the people voted for him, you'd have to elect him president because when those same androids are taking over our planet, his negotiating with them is going to keep all of humanity from getting the, I don't get it. I'm sorry. I know that was a Battlestar Galactica, but I don't. What? <laughs> Carlos Danger. Oh, hi, Sam. So when's the debate about voting strategy with Kyle Kalinske going to happen? There's a Jimmy Dore circa 2016 vibe going on. I, I, I think we'll wait. I think we'll wait. At, late in the summer, maybe. Uh, Sam's midlife crisis to uh, crisis TikTok account. Okay. Sam's midlife crisis TikTok account. Sam, I think you underestimate the potential vector. Big box stores can be. A lot of it isn't just density of people, but the product of closeness and the amount of time you spend near people, hence how bad restaurants are. When hundreds of people from all over in the same store and spend an hour plus in the same space recirculating mm -hmm. the air, it's a risk factor. My point is reducing st uh, store trips is definitely something people should also do, without a doubt. Well, I, am, I think it's almost better to be in um, shorter periods of time uh, and move quickly. Um, did I tell you how our economy's opened here? What no. that experience has been like? Um, so I got once a week and I, I, you know, I went to go to the store to, to get the groceries and it was next to all these restaurants. I, the patios were packed. I saw one person at this outdoor shopping center with a bunch of restaurants, one person with a mask including the staff of the restaurants. Wow. That's it's horrifying. So and they weren't distanced. That's so they different weren't. from up here uh, yeah. and in, in New York. Everybody in New York is wearing a mask now. I would say 95% of the people in New York City. As they as far should as I be. Tell. I mean, uh, even when I went to the grocery store like a week ago, people were wearing masks. But it's like as soon as they declare the, the economy open, people took off their – or the Trumpy people went out and said, you know. And up here, we're a couple hours out, and I would say – 80% of the people wear masks. Hmm. Um, is that just because you're like a little bit of a, of a mini New York city? Or is it I like think it's close state? proximity. Uh, I think it's close proximity and there's just a general awareness. Um, I don't, I don't, you know, uh, I haven't been enough other places to yeah. make an assessment, but um, wearing a mask Anywhere in New York, uh, as far as I can tell, probably between the Albany and uh, New York City corridor, you, I don't think you feel un uncomfortable at all. Isn't um, it strange? My mom got yelled at yesterday walking because she was wearing a mask. For wearing one? For wearing a mask. She, this woman goes up and she goes, you don't have to wear it. You're outside. And my mom's like, I said, mom, you should just tell her you have COVID. I'll tell you <laughs> But, you know, the thing is, is that, uh, you know, unless she's wearing a mask that is super protect, I mean, it will offer some protection, but not, a, you know, like the real protection comes from the, that lady yes. yelling at her, yes. spewing her uh, asymptomatic uh, viral load at your mom, right. who should right. be wearing the mask. That's why our masks at the merch store say your mask protects me, my mask protects you, and Ivana, Ivanka Tinkle on the I am you finally have merch been waiting for this stuff for a long time indeed Bane Cedar you think you can just have the Medicare that would not claim that we would not claim the Medicare the Medicare is for all now <laughs> Bob Fossey Trump's doc is giving him Flintstones vitamins every morning and telling me it's hydroxychloroquine <laughs> Trump's high hydroxychloroquine dealer I'm supposed to start graduate school in New York in the fall any thoughts on the likelihood of that happening I'm doubtful that on-campus classes will happen in the fall, at least in New York. Thanks. Um, the only thing I, I do think it's possible that in some instances there may be, I know of some architects who have are working on this and there are, there's some talk that there will be at some university will attempt to do uh, outdoor classes Oh, under uh, tents. Now, I don't know how long into the wow. season you can do that, but, if you could get two or three months of outdoor classes and then everybody, uh, you know, uh, disperses for a while, I don't know. I, I, I think it's, it, you know, I don't think anybody knows. They're um, opening if, school here at U of A, um, which is really, you know, 
But what's really fascinating about this, Gosh. this is like 40,000 students. And, and U of A is like Tucson's not, I mean, it's a little bit more progressive, especially around the university. That's where Noam Chomsky teaches, just to put this in perspective. Oh. So the president of the school is a doctor and he's the one saying it's going to be fine. Wow. Yep. Wow. Can't do outdoor classes in, in Arizona wow. in August. <sighs> I don't know. I want to be in a place with air conditioning either, frankly. Why? Oh, because it's the air circulates. Yeah. Yeah. Well, luckily. Hey, Square. <laughs> Sam, you know the only reason Cavuto pushed back on Hydrock is because his uh, his older parents or people in his circle are getting ready to take the drug. It could very well be. Yeah. Train boy. I think it's interesting that the biggest pushers of hydro hydroxychloroquine in office are all associates of Steve Bannon. Bolsonaro, Johnson, Trump have all pushed hydroxychloroquine. Hmm. All three friends of Bannon, Modi, Abe, and Netanyahu are all very right wing, but don't associate with Bannon and haven't, to my knowledge, pushed it. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, it is interesting. Hmm. You, you've been talking a lot about uh, Bannon, haven't you? Yeah, yeah. Well, he you was- think all roads lead back to Bannon. I, do. I, I think you may be right. I do. I, 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 you know, I probably should think about it a little bit more. But I also, I, I told you, I was in the EU last year um, during the elections, and that was when he set up this. I never thought he was actually banished. I think there were just factions, like as was reported, but I don't think he ever was banished by Trump. I think there was always, you know, a line I agree. of contact. I agree. Um, just like Roger Stone. They were like, oh, Roger Stone left the campaign. I mean, now he's in jail, but like, right. out of jail, but he never left the campaign. Um, so Bannon set up this, this like, uh, what was it like a monastery in in Italy? Did you hear about this? Yeah, I don't know if this came over to America. This story, but it was crazy. It was a right wing monastery, and he was working on the the EU elections in general. It was a great failure, but I think there was something else there too. I mean, I can't imagine he just decided to focus solely on the EU. I think he was probably testing messaging, and he's but obsessed with China. I mean, this is something he's been going around the world giving speeches to right wing leaders about China. You know, it's interesting because um, when uh, Janine Garofalo and I in the old Majority Report, we interviewed Gary Hart hmm. in 2004. Wow. And Gary That's Hart, and I can't remember who else it was, but maybe it was Rudman. I'm not sure. Hart Rudman sounds familiar to me. They had a panel that in the summer of 2000, that was a commission on the 21st century threats to America. Hmm. And there was about 20 people on the panel. And they went around to each person at the beginning of the, the first meeting. And they said, name the biggest threat, national security to America. And just about everybody said it was non-state actors, right? Hmm. International terrorists, <laughs> which turned out to be uh, fairly prescient. One person said China and uh, they reconvened like a month or two later. And they again started off the meeting that way as a way of making sure that, you know, like to see if people had readjusted their thoughts or whatnot. Went around, went around, went around. One person said uh, China and uh, everybody was just like basically dismissed it. And that person never returned to the panel. Lynn Cheney. Wow. Yep. So much to think about there. I know, right? Well, I'm quite convinced that that Iraq was largely about China. Oh, and that and, that and, and not necessarily yeah. specifically China, but 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 largely from the perspective of they the, those folks from the Project for New American Century had this notion of America being a hyperpower that they could go through the world, that we could, we could uh, manage low-level conflicts all around the world, but nobody would be big enough right. uh, to become a superpower and challenge us. And I think that one of the important elements of that from a geopolitical standpoint was for them to control the spigot of oil mm -hmm. in the Middle East. Right. Less so that we could have it for free. I mean, obviously, you have your buddies make profit off it. But more so that we could control the spigot so that if China, China would right. not have literally the fuel for their economy. Right. Um, well, and, it's, and, and Afghanistan was really interesting. I mean, 
it's, it's relevant now the, the the actual conversation about this but so so much of that early obama era of managing afghanistan was over was over control of 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 infrastructure pipelines. what was that pipelines pipelines infrastructure in afghanistan but between china and and the us building the infrastructure around it and you know it was it was a turf turf war essentially yep uh, Colin from Nebraska, and there was actually a big, um, the PPP was part of that. It was the sort of the economic way of trying to isolate China. Mm -hmm. Uh, I went and I cannot remember the name of the ship, but I got, um, I got bumped from a flight in LA actually coming back from doing Mark Maron's TV show. And I stayed down in Long Beach because they offered like 1300 bucks. And I literally jumped out of my seat. I was in the way back of the plane. I like ran on top, like I, I just, $1,300. So I was like, oh my God. <laughs> it, would, it ended up being like, uh, I think it was, it was $1,300. I'd never heard an offer for like that before I got there so quickly. And ended up, you know, how uh, I went, went with the family to, to Italy actually uh, that year based on that $1,300. So I'm like, this is going to get me to Italy. And, uh, so, uh, but they put us up in a hotel down, like, I think in Long Beach and where there's, an, there, there was a big, uh, for a decommissioned, uh, battle cruiser. Oh. I think it was, um, the, 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 the Queen Mary, that's not no. a battle cruiser, but that's the Long Beach. No, okay, I, go ahead. Yeah. I don't know what it was, what the, what the boat was. And I went on there and there was a guy who was explaining like where we, that all our ships had been re, uh, positioned to the Pacific. And it was some phrase turned towards Asia or something um, that was uh, under the Obama administration, that there was a military reorientation of our naval um, uh, strength, basically as a function of, uh, of China. Wow. Yep. Colin from Nebraska. My sister-in-law's wedding is less than a month away. The original number of people attending is 400 plus. And I think the majority are still planning on coming. I feel bad, but I don't want to go. This is so stupid. I hope the Catholic Church hosting it gets a large amount of scrutiny. Also, just bought some masks. Thanks, Sam. Love that message. Left is best. Great. Well, you know, I mean, uh, I, I, I understand your hesitation. And, uh, you know, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what you do in that situation. I don't know how people are having a wedding like that. It just seems. A friend of mine told me that in New York uh, last weekend, they walked by a church in Astoria where I live and saw a wedding going on, a full on wedding. That just seems nuts to me. In New York. And, I mean, uh, the, the, here's Sherrod Brown. Let's just, I want to play this clip because um, this, uh, Sherrod Brown gets to the, to the nub of it, I think here when he's talking to Steve Mnuchin. Uh, Republicans seem to have no urgency about passing a, another um, COVID relief bill. Uh, part of that, I think, is, and to the extent that they want it, they were willing to do so, they would only do so with, with liability, with immunity for corporations and employers, and bringing back um, workers and presumably consumers so that they didn't have stringent requirements and that's what this means. When you get rid of someone's immunity, it means that you're diminishing their responsibility to act in a certain way to their workers, to their consumers. And so it means that diminish standards for what they have to do. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you go into a store uh, and there's plastic now that they put in front of the, um, uh, the checkout uh, right. counter. And they put plastic down there so that people aren't, you know, the, the air is not going both ways proper protections, gloves, masks, et cetera. Well, the Republicans didn't want that in the bill because they want to make sure that people have to come back and have no redress to not come back. Right. Here's Sherrod Brown talking about uh, Mnuchin. And now I think they don't want to pass the bill because they're like, well, that's also going to put pressure on getting people back. Here's, um, here's Sherrod Brown talking to Mnuchin about uh, risk. 
Mnuchin, let me go somewhere else. Public health ex experts have told us it's not safe to reopen the economy until we have worker protections in place that will con control the spread of COVID. Things like testing, contract tracing, protective equipment, uh, efforts that the president has clearly failed to lead to help our country. Uh, Secretary Mnuchin, you said there's considerable risk of not reopening, that keeping some businesses closed could cause permanent economic damage. How many workers will die if we send people back to work without the protections they need, Mr. Secretary? Mr. Senator, we don't intend to send anybody back to work without the protections. And I would say I was prepared to come there today. I thought it was safe to testify. Matter of fact, I already was at the Senate this morning wearing a mask. And I assure you, uh, both myself and everybody on the task force, the vice president and others are following the best medical advice. And uh, I, I couldn't be more proud of the medical advice that we're getting and the way the economy is opening up in a safe way. So how many how many workers should give their lives to increase our GDP by half a percent? That you're, that you're pushing people back into the workplace. You, there's been no national program to provide worker safety. The president says reopen slaughterhouses, nothing about slowing the line down, nothing about getting protective equipment. Is, is, is How many workers should give their lives to increase the GDP or the Dow Jones by a thousand points? You know, workers should give their lives to do that, Mr. Senator. And I think your characterization is unfair. We have provided enormous amounts of equipment. We've worked with the governors. We've done a terrific job. of getting you know, Mr. Secretary, I, I'm not going to let you make a political speech about how what a great job we hear that from the president in his news conferences, when in fact this country, uh, the president did is, is still not led an effort to scale up testing. He's played state after state state against state. He's played hospital against hospital to get protective equipment. Everybody in the country, your comments notwithstanding, knows that. Chair Powell, um, you said... Good. Now, go, good for Sheriff Brown, but here's another question you could have asked him. How many tests have you had? Right. How many tests has every single person on that commission had? Why will you, you... You talk about how safe it is to go into work. You're surrounded by people who have taken tests. Everybody in that Senate has taken tests. When are you going to provide tests for everybody uh, across the country? When are you going to make sure that nobody can get into the Senate without having taken a test? When are you going to make sure that everybody who goes into work can't get into work until they've taken a test? Right. I mean, that's the bottom line. They're not providing the same protections they're affording themselves. No. Not even close. Good on Sherrod Brown. I mean, like that, uh, God, he needs to get out more. <laughs> well, you know, there's a problem I, with that. I mean, out in front of camera. <laughs> I know. <what> <laughs> Uh, yeah, but he's got the perfect message. I mean, seriously, yep. you could not. I mean, it's just hearing him compared to every other Democrat who's been so weak. I mean, honestly, I, I, I even look at him and I'm like, where, where's Bernie right now? I don't want to criticize him too much, but giving giving live streams to your audience is one thing, but it was brilliant. It was, yep. That's what it's a shame. Call him from a 503 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Is this me? Yes, it is you. Is this me? It is you. Oh, hello. Hello. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not oh, sure. Ho, 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 ho. Can you back off your phone just a little bit? 503? Uh. That, that may have been a little too much. Hello? Going once. Austin. Are you there? I, I didn't mean go across the, the room. I mean, can you hear me? I'm outside. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I can hear okay. you fine. Okay, just talk a little softer or just put the phone just a little further away from your mouth. That's all. Just a little bit hot. Okay, is this good? That's great. What's your name? Awesome. Where are you calling from? I'm um, Byron calling from Portland. Okay, Byron, you got to go back to the way when you said, is this good? Okay, I'm right. here now. That's great. Good? That's great. What's awesome. up, Byron? So I'm not sure how invested in this topic you are, but I can't pass up an opportunity to crap on Ben Shapiro. Oh, I'm very invested. Please. Awesome. So he made a video ranking all of the Star Wars movies on which one is better and worse. Okay. And he decided to put uh, The Phantom Menace under The Last Jedi, which I think is absolutely abhorrent. All right. The Phantom Menace, because I just watched all these with my son. So uh, under uh, Phantom, awesome. Phantom Menace is not as good as The Last Jedi. Is that what he's saying? 
yes, he he put Phantom Menace on the bottom of the list. What, uh, no, what was the Phantom, I think, what I was think the Phantom Menace the again? Which one, the list. which one? Which one was Phantom Menace? Which one what, uh, was that? The the one made just before Episode the, One. Episode One. Oh well, that's mm-hmm. ridiculous. The Last Jedi was the worst. I am so. Oh, nervous. awesome! I'm, I'm so happy that you agree. He is definitely not a nerd. I can't. I can't fathom why he believes that. No, he's not. He's not a nerd. He's just uh, just a loser. <laughs> he's just a loser. Mm-hmm. He doesn't even. He doesn't have even nerd bona fides. Um, <laughs> yes, I, I totally agree. Uh, well, Byron, I'm glad we've we've been able to uh, to meet uh, on these terms. Yes, I'm happy. Happy to talk to you, Sam. You're doing a great job. Thank you, Byron. Appreciate the call. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Not even remotely close. I mean, uh, the, the 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 last three were basically retreads of uh, no, the other you. six that had taken place. Sam, I'm, I'm going to move myself out of this conversation. I've yeah. seen Star Wars once, only yeah. one, the original, and that's it. Oh, that's I'm, it. I'm so not a nerd. I'm sorry to. I, I mean, I'm not a particular nerd about it either. I don't, you know, uh, you know, I've I've probably watched uh, the, you know, I watched the first three uh, probably a couple three or four times because, you know, we do you go through it with each kid. Right. right and, then, right, you know, I'd seen yeah, it as a kid kids, too. Yeah. And, uh, but, uh, the last three, eh, I, I would know. say the it's only like... real nerd bona fides on this show is your love for Battlestar Galactica. I think beyond that, none of us have much bona fides anywhere. Maybe we need to get someone for that. Oh yeah. Um, well, I can also, I can actually, um, just about every single uh, Clint Eastwood movie that was made prior to probably 1980, I could tell you with, uh, if you played for me the sound of it for 15 seconds, I could tell you which movie it was. I could be Godfather. Sight unseen. Sight unseen. So that's a new game. Yep. What's, what's everybody's special? Mafia movies for me. Any mafia movie, Italian, Indian, doesn't matter. That's really? all I watch. It's really a weird, yeah, I'm, I'm obsessed with the mafia. That's pretty good. No, it's a little disturbing, actually. <laughs> I wonder what it says about uh, <laughs> what's going on in Arizona. <laughs> calling from a 512 area code. Who's this? Where are you calling from? Oh, oh hi. Good afternoon, Sam. It's Lucy from Brooklyn. Lucy from Brooklyn. How are you, Lucy? What's on your mind? Um, I'm enraged but you know <laughs> healthy otherwise good um so <laughs> uh so just for any keyboard warriors out there um i'm gonna play huge identity politics so if you're gonna get offended leave the room um a uh, black woman haitian woman uh, first generation relevant to that i've been hearing a lot of calls talking about where's the rich? i'm sorry uh, where, where are the where are the people who are up with the Democratic Party, where is where's the the outcry? And as a black woman, I feel like we've been crying out for a very long time. Um, sorry, I'm a little emotional here, but like we've been crying out for a very long time. Black people in the country have been crying out for a very long time, and in New York specifically, um, as reflected in other parts of the country. Um, COVID has hit us the hardest. Yeah. Um, I think you've done a spectacular job of um, between conversation amongst um, yourself and guests. I think you've done a spectacular job of really, you know, talking about the history and context of it. But, you know, just right now, um, what drives me a little crazy is just people saying that. And then also, you know, us Black people doing the work. Um, I mean, had the uh the head of the nurses union on your show a couple weeks ago and um camera Jean Ross. Um even at protests in front of the White House, it was mostly black women with those ADHQs. Right. Um you had Winston Pendergrass on your show uh, a couple weeks ago on the Maytay protest. That's another black woman. Like we enraged. You've been crying out. We've been on the on the ground doing the work. We're on the ground getting sick. Um, it is Haitian nurses that are on the front line um, and that make up at least 30% of the nurse population. Wow. Um, and so, you know, and as far as COVID victims, you know, the mean across uh, metropolitan cities 
is as far as those who have the illness and those who die from it, we're between 30 and 40. And so I just wonder, you know, I just wonder where everyone else's outrage is. Because mine is here. It's in a bag that I carry on me, walking around, doing shit, uh, and trying to stay healthy for myself. Um, and I know other people who are doing the work as well. Um, like a friend of mine, uh, Ashley Berry, who is based in New Orleans, and she's doing incredible work uh, bringing awareness about how COVID has destroyed the restaurant industry. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, as a as a wine professional myself, I don't really see a, my career for another year or two. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I just feel like I don't I don't think it's our turn to be angry or any more angry or any more visible. Angry. I think it's other people's turn to do that. Um, and specifically, you know, white people and white people with privilege and in both in income and also their position in the world. I mean, you mentioned before that, you know, you'll probably be fine under a Biden administration. Uh, under a, a know, Trump, a Trump administration. Under a Trump or a Biden administration, right. white men will most, mostly be fine. Right. Um, and, you know, there's been debates and huge shout out to Jamie. I mean, she just, I know that she can, you know, some people dismiss her, but, you know, I think she really speaks to the rage that I've been feeling and the rage that, you know, a lot of um, working communities have been feeling. But anyway, Ramble, I just, you know, you know, I think it's somebody else's turn to do the work, to come up with a strategy to, you know, do more than just clap outside of their windows and beat their pots and pans. It's time for everybody else to be striking. Uh, for everybody else to be, you know, doing the essential work services, not just the, you know, uh, not just the African and Caribbean immigrants or the Asians who are being berated and beat down. Um, it's somebody else's job to be enraged. And I don't, I also think it's somebody else's job to look for it. Um, and I, I don't know, I, you were mentioning strategy before, and I personally, I don't, I don't know what the strategy is. Um, especially in my position, I'm immunocompromised. So it's like, even if I could go out and protest, I probably shouldn't, but I don't, I don't know what the strategy is. I just, I just feel like, you know, we've, we've done the work and we've been doing the work and doing a lot of the suffering and that's all. Thanks for, thanks for the time. Sorry. Uh, I, I rambled on a bit. There. No, uh, and Lucy, I really appreciate the, the perspective and, you know, uh, I, 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 I'm not surprised that, uh, you feel, and I imagine others feel exhausted by it, um, in terms of, um, you know, the African-American community, uh, Latino community rates of infection and, and mortality much higher than, uh, white communities. Um, uh, people uh, living in low incomes as well. Um, a lot of the jobs that, um, uh, people ha- uh, of color have, or end up being frontline um, uh, jobs in this uh, situation. And well, I mean, it, and I'm, I'm sorry to cut in, but just very briefly, um, even in leisure, right? Even in just trying to relax and go to the park, walk around for 10, 15 minutes. I mean, the most extreme example is, you know, um, recently Armoda Arbery um, being shot and killed for a jog. But another extreme example in in New York is like, you know, we walk around without a mask, you get beat into the ground with a concussion or, or, you know, get in prison. But like in Fort Greene, where, you know, the restaurant I managed um, is uh, or was, um, the law is a suggestion for them. They have open bottles of actually really nice wine. They have open (laughs) bottles of wine, drinking it in the street, no mask, all close proximity. And, you know, I see cops just walking by and, and giving them a heads up and saying, you know, please, you know, peru- you know, continue doing whatever you're doing. It's just like, we can't, we can't work in peace. We can't protest in peace. We can't walk around in peace. When now with COVID, we can't even die in peace. Right. And so it's like, I, I, I don't, you know, 
sorry. I'm so sorry. To well, you know, it, it, there's, there's, very there's video of Ahmed Arbery. I mean, just to, you raised him, uh, this is pre COVID, I believe, but he, there's, there's uh, cop cam video of him being essentially harassed by the cops. He was in a park. Um, he basically explained to them, like, I come here, I have one day off a week. I come here in the morning to rap because it's calming for me. And they're harassing him. And they would have tased him, but uh, one of the cops' taser didn't work. And, um, <laughs> and, and yeah. And um, I, I mean, I, 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 I don't know what to say beyond like, you know, um, you know, I think w w people like um, like myself who do have more privilege, both in terms of like, uh, you know, just the ability, the freedom to go around and um, uh, the ability to work from home, but also the ability to sort of walk around if I wanted to without a mask. Um, uh you know, I agree with you. We need to do more. I mean, this is sort of like a, you know, our obligation to society. And um, I, I, I wish I had a better answer for you. Um, but That's interesting. Um, I, 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 I have one quick thing before I go. Um, as a much lighter note, um, thing that's been helping me sleep recently, in addition to CBD. Um, <laughs> is watching your Dave Rubin takedown videos. Like I have a playlist and I, I fall asleep laughing and it's, oh it's wonderful. So thank you for that. Oh, well, nice. uh, my pleasure. Believe me, believe me. <laughs> um, I don't know. Uh, Nomi, do you want to say anything? I mean, I, I, I you know, yeah. I, my, my heart goes out to you, Lucy. I mean, I, and, and uh, yeah. it's, you know, it, it, when, whenever society gets hit with any type of crisis, it is always the same people who end up paying the price. Yes. Um, right. I mean, you know, to a large extent, you, you know, even on 9-11, yeah. the yep. um, first responders and yeah. the, the first responders and, you know, a lot of the people who uh, who died in there were, you know, uh, were, were, were people who were just, you know, just didn't have the same opportunities to get out or come into work later or, or whatever it was. Um, and then our, our government makes it, I mean, especially if we're under a Republican government, especially so, um, they exacerbate it by finding some sort of opportunity in the crisis to make working people, poor people who are working, suffer even more so. I mean, I, I just read like two minutes ago that Trump uh, is is sending our National Guard home now um, off COVID duties yes. a day before their benefits would Yes, uh, let me read that story because it's really important to talk about. Uh, Lucy, I really appreciate the yeah. call. Hang, hang in there. Um, Thank you, Lucy. I, I don't know what else to say. I really, I. I while you're pulling up that story, um, I just want to show one little thing because we, you know, we at Matriarch, we have all these candidates who, it's really important that we pick a very diverse, like working class, um, group of candidates so that they can talk about these things in Congress, so that we don't have Nancy Pelosi's. I mean, that's part of 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 the privilege that's not being. Um, it's not being addressed it's because the people in power have an enormous, extraordinary amount of privilege. Extraordinary, be not beyond just being white, but being being very, very, very wealthy. And one of our candidates, Cori Bush, who I think a lot of you know, you know, she's a nurse and she had COVID. And so the energy and the mindset that she's bringing to her campaign, or Nabila, whose mother lost her job, who grew up in a in a hut in Bangladesh you know, whose, whose family members were persecuted for activism. I mean, it's like, this is a different type of energy that we need in Congress so that we prioritize. That's, that's what, I mean, if I want to channel my energy into something, it's amplifying those voices because it's, it's, I can only, right. you know, you want some Congress people who have the ability to say like, Oh, uh, what is, what is this lockdown mean to me? Right. Right. Not the challenge of how do we get everybody in the family to have, you know, three deep options on ice cream, but it's, um, you know, uh, how am I not going to infect my family? Cause I'm coming home from work and I'm having a strip in the hallway yeah. and put my clothes in a bag and, and shower and wash, or how am I going to get, you know, how am I going to make sure that my mask is clean because I've got to wear it seven days in a row. Cause it's all full of sweat and whatnot. Mm -hmm. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, um, I've got to go and, you know, uh, go into apartment buildings 
uh, you know, to make deliveries because I can't afford to take time off from work or something to that effect. Or I'm, you know, I've got to go on the subway because my job is an hour and a half away from where I live. And um, there's no way for me to get there. I mean, there's a, there's a whole host of those uh, things that I, I don't know if Nancy Pelosi has a, knows anybody. And I don't know that there's many people kids. in Congress who know who knows many people uh, who 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 even knows of uh, you know like once removed. No, um, yeah, and and not only like one thing we we keep. So these are people working, multiple people working in a home. Sometimes several family members. They've they've documented more cases because of that in in certain parts of New York because there are more family members who live in that apartment. But then these are kids who are have to be taught by their parents who are working all day. How is this? Yep. I mean, that that's just going to have such long term effects on society when a certain class of folks can either afford to take care of their kids and 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 teach them from home, or there's some other person brought in because we know that's probably happening uh, to teach their their kids at home. I mean, once again, we are just setting up systemic issues. We already had income inequality in New York worse than ever. I have I, I don't even know what it's going to look like after this. It's it's, it's, it's going to be insane. All right, let me just do this story. Uh, folks, we don't have time for any more calls. Uh, apologies. Um, this is, you know, this is one of those stories where it's like, I, I feel pretty confident that Joe Biden wouldn't be doing something like this. Yeah, that's okay. uh, and, and, and like, again, it's a low bar, but it's just, it's, and I don't know that the Republicans are going to get away with this, to be honest with you, but we'll see. Mm-hmm. Um, the Trump administration had plans on an interagency call in May, uh, like seven days ago. Apparently Politico uh, uh, found an audio version. Uh, An official acknowledged during that call that the June 24th deadline in terms of pulling back 40,000 National Guards. So what's happened is because it's a crisis, because it's an emergency, the federal government pays for the National Guard to go in and in New York State, I imagine this is ever, but New York State, they set up all the extra hospitals. They're right. doing a lot of the testing. They're going in and um, they're doing all sorts of things that frontline people do. Right. And they, uh, they are deployed being paid under a, uh, you know, uh, emergency statute. So the federal government picks it up. They have now a June 24th deadline, which means that thousands of members who first deployed in late March will find themselves with 89 credit days of duty. They were deployed in early March. They go to June 24th, 89 days. Why 89 days? Why is that so important? Because under the statute that has the federal government uh, activate National Guardsmen for emergencies, 90 days is the threshold when you qualify for early retirement and education benefits under the post 9-11 GI Bill. Unreal. Now, this is amazing. They are aware on this phone call that it will require, quote, a delicate messaging strategy. (laughs) We would, this this is a quote. We would greatly benefit from unified messaging regarding the conclusion of their services prior to hitting the 90 day mark and the retirement benefit implications associated with it. In other words, we want all of you to say, we don't need these people anymore. Governors and lawmakers in both parties have been pleading with the White House to extend the federal order for several more months or till the end of the year. Warning in a letter to Trump that terminating federal deployments early in the summer as just as states are reopening could contribute to possible second wave of infection. 40,000 guard, guard members are serving under the federal orders known as Title 32, which grants them federal pay and benefits, but puts them under local command in 44 states and three territories and the District of Columbia. Hmm. Largest deployment since Hurricane Katrina. Tens of thousands of them have been working full time since March. They're doing all sorts of like they're decontaminating nursing homes, setting up field hospitals, testing for the virus. The cost of the deployment is almost $10 million a month for every 1,000 troops. Okay. States would have to pay for this Hmm. if uh, Title 32 expires. 
the states don't have the money for this. Right, right. Now listen to this. Listen, listen, like they're they're so concerned about hitting this threshold for retirement. Guard members can move up that retirement by three months for every 90 days. So you're gonna have 40,000 people who are gonna be able to move up their retirement by three months. And it also means that they qualify for 40% off the tuition at a public college or university. Now, here's the other thing. Because they have to self-quarantine for two weeks before returning to civilian life, these people are going to evacuate around June 10th or June 5th. This is nuts. And then where do they go? Do they pay for their quarantine? That's a good question. They probably go to some type of barracks or something, right? Like they would all go as a unit. Um, but this is nuts. This is nuts. It's inf- I mean, this is, uh, this is the, uh, the military budget. Like what, what? It is. They just don't want these people to retire. They don't want them to have benefits. There you go, folks. And you know, who's going to end up, uh, I mean, uh, it's just unbelievable. This is when I miss John Stewart. Three, uh, let's do three, uh, four more IMs in the line here. Uh, Social Jewish Warrior, did anyone see AOS, a- AOS, AOC open up a can of whoop ass on her primary challenger last night? Fun stuff. I didn't. No, I, I would didn't like to. It. We should I look saw it. Yeah. I saw it trending. Colin Bowell. Hi, MR crew. Love the show. It always makes me laugh when a conspiracy theorist believe COVID is an acronym revealing a mass genocide plan. They've been watching too many Bond movies. By the way, you can't order the MR merch outside the U.S., Oh, I'm sorry. Left is best. Huh? Hmm. We'll work on that. Rick from Florida. So I understand the Democrats are bad at doing things that the left wants because they're the center party. But what I can't understand is why the Democrats so bad holding on to their own power for years. They've been getting crushed in state legislatures, governorships, and most importantly, in the courts, while Republicans simultaneously do everything in their power to gerrymander rollback protections until they get down in the trenches on these issues. It appears they have no interest in doing so. Our democracy remain fundamentally broken. I agree with you. I agree with all of that. I don't even well, understand under their own terms why they don't do better. It's why, I mean, why is Sherrod Brown not, you know, put in a, in a greater position of power? It's, you know, why is Pramila, Pramila Jayapal constantly, you know, her caucus isn't unified. It's the people in power know exactly what they're getting out of it. Uh, these, aren't, these aren't hard decisions to make. Final I am for the day. Why don't progressives talk about Jayapal as a VP pick? Not she's that not I, an American. She's not she an American, born American citizen. Or she wasn't born in America. She's oh, yeah, president. she's not a natural born citizen, right? Exactly. Is that it? Yes, not a natural born citizen. That's why. Yeah. All right, folks. Yeah. Nomi, as always, folks, uh, tune into Nomi's show. Thank you. When do you release it? So we release it on YouTube on Mondays, uh, Monday afternoon, I guess, out here on the Pacific, on the on the West Coast. Uh, so it's up on YouTube now, and then we have segments released throughout the week. And then if you're a patron, it's on the weekends. So go to patreon.com slash the Nomi Key Show. We've got lots of, oh, and now I, this is kind of a crazy thing. Uh, someone on our team came up with this idea. I'm going to be doing cooking segments, not because, well, I did it once and I guess it did well. And so now people want it. They've asked for it. So there you go. Politics, not a new idea, but it's all I'm doing now. <laughs> Cooking and talking politics. For live streams, Tuesdays and Thursday live streams in the evening. There you go, folks. All right. We will see you tomorrow. Bye. It might take all the strength I got to get to where I want. But I know somehow I'm going to get there. I wasn't looking when I just got caught. Between the truth and the light bar But finding out won't make me feel any better